the special governing board meeting for the Vallejo City Unified School District, May 29th, 2013, is now called to order. Roll call, please. Trustee Waterman. Present. Trustee Mumson. Present. Trustee Stewart. Here. Vice President Vivaldi. Here. President Wilson. Present. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. to go over the purpose of tonight's meeting. Tonight's meeting is to address agenda item 3.1, review of grand jury report, and item 3.2, review of district actions. Before we get into tonight's agenda, I would like to have our board agenda adopted. Thank you. On behalf of the board, we want to welcome everyone here this evening. The board, after receiving the grand jury report, asks that we hold a special meeting at Vallejo High School concerning this matter. At this time, we will adopt uh, our agenda for this evening. Madam President, I move that we adopt the uh, uh, agenda before us. I would second. It has been moved by Director Ubaldi, seconded by Director Mumson, that we adopt the agenda as printed. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The agenda is adopted as printed. Director Shackelford, would you like to continue? Thank you, President Wilson. Before we get into tonight's agenda, I would like for us to go over some of the meeting protocols, protocols for this evening. Very important protocols for this evening. It's important to the board as well as to our superintendent that our community has time on tonight's agenda to speak to the recommendations made by the grand jury. What we're asking is that for all of the yellow speaker cards, when you fill it out, please write which recommendation you would like to speak to. And to my left, to my right, you will find um, 15 bins, one through 15, where you can place your yellow card, just depending on which item you would like to speak to. Number two, when it comes to the individualized speakers, we will be allowing three minutes per person. And we're asking that all of us respect the three minute time limit to be very clear and succinct with the comments that you would like to make on tonight. Are all minds clear? Are all minds clear? Yeah. All, right. all right, well with that, I would like to begin by just establishing where we start from when it comes to why we are here and what all of us as educators, as family members, as community members, what we do within the school district from day to day. Let's start with our mission. As you can see here, our mission covers four distinct areas. Equity, excellence, educational effectiveness, economic sustainability. You will see that it is important to our district that we maintain collaborative teamwork in order to accomplish our goals. We recognize that it's very important to maintain positive home to school relationships and safety is critical for each of our school campuses. At the end of the day, 
it is important that we're consistently assessing where we are in meeting our goals. And we do these types of assessments through walkthroughs, progress reports, test scores, etc. Let's move now in regard to our belief system as an organization. What is it that we believe as Vallejo City Unified School District when it comes to equity? Can everyone see the bullets, the three bullets? Yes? All right, I'm gonna ask you to read for me tonight. Can everyone read that first bullet? What does it say? Every adult is responsible for every student's success. Every adult. How many adults do we have in here today? That includes me, that includes you. Those of us who work or that are employed within the Vallejo City Unified School District, we accept that responsibility that, su that the success of our children is dependent upon us. Number two, can you read that for me? Every student has the opportunity to learn and reach their goals. And the third bullet is that we have engaging learning environments. Moving on to our second set of core values, which deal with excellence. And the two that I want us to focus in on is having high expectations for all of our students and ensuring that our students have the opportunity to be productive community members. Our last core value has to do with educational effectiveness ensuring that all of our classrooms have a high engaging learning environment, our learning environments are safe, and that every adult, student, will model honesty, integrity, and respect. With that, let us go right into another clip of the Grand Jewelry. Thinking that I knew a lot about government, which I did not, 
in the grand jury, talk to that minister. And I was able to see everything that the grand jury had accomplished in a short period of six months when I came on. And I was absolutely amazed at the various projects that the grand jury had involved itself in. I think grand jury duty is just great. So if you have an opportunity, please do sign up for it. Thank you. Anybody with time in their hands, I would encourage you to join the grand jury. You'll find it very satisfactory, rewarding. You will have put your idle hours to some good use, and the end result could end up being you save the county or your city some money. Hopefully, I can serve another term of a year because I feel this is just a tremendous opportunity for the average ordinary taxpaying citizen to really see how the government runs and to really have an opportunity to make a difference from grassroots on up. So thank you very much. Hi, my name is Gary Walker from Fairfield, California. And the grand jury is the purest form of democracy I think that you'll ever find. It's an ability for an average citizen to view and discover and recommend to the presiding judge changes local government. You have an opportunity at any age to get on the grand jury that will help you discover how government works. And through that process, you can make recommendations that will change the process and make it more efficient. If you have the opportunity, I would suggest very strongly to uh, volunteer and get on the grand jury and really discover how local government works. My name is Paul Beeman. I'm a Superior Court Judge here in Solano County. Currently, I'm sitting as the presiding judge in our county. That means for all of 2012 and 2013. In that capacity, I serve as a special advisor to our civil grand jury. Now, the grand jury itself is established by the California State Constitution. Now, the county and the court are required by the Constitution maintain a civil grand jury at all times. Unlike a jury trial in an individual case, this grand jury exists for 12 months at a time. The members of the grand jury frequently serve more than one term. The law allows for them to do that. The primary function of grand juries is to investigate citizens' complaints about public agencies and public officials, as well as to look in and provide citizen oversight on local government and its efficiencies or the lack thereof. The grand jury is authorized by law to examine all aspects of county government, city governments, school districts, any special districts that exist within this county. The grand jury has the authority to review evaluate procedures and systems within each governmental entity. All right, with that, I'm going to give it back to the hands of President Wilson, and she will be introducing each of the recommendations for tonight. President Wilson. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I want to um, note is that the governing board will provide a response to the grand jury. And our response is due by August 14, 2013. Therefore, it is, was very important to me and the governing board that we had an opportunity to listen to all sides, to all parties, and to make our response as fair as possible. We recognize that work is needed to be done. Yeah. We recognize that much work has already been done. It is important to us to provide an accurate response and to get clarity where possible this evening concerning some of the findings and recommendations. At this time, I will ask my fellow board members to assist me I left my plain glasses at home, so I have to have these on uh, to read. So I'm going to have them assist me. Um, finding number one and the recommendation, I'm going to ask 
Director Wadham, would she please read it? First recommendation and finding of the grand jury, the Vallejo City Unified School District must provide all teachers with two-way radios to communicate directly with campus supervisors. Please read the finding first. Uh, pardon me. teachers who have access to two-way radios to communicate directly with campus supervisors. So the recommendation of the grand jury is the Vallejo City Unified School District provide all teachers with two-way radios to communicate with campus supervisors. Shall I read our response? No. Er. So in regards to the High School has created a system to streamline the communication process between teachers, staff, site safety supervisors, and administration. Um, Renati Santos, assistant principal. Jessica Brown, assistant principal. Thank you, and now we will have uh, public comment. I specifically, uh, on the agenda, originally we had public comment at the end, but I want to make sure that every that I hear from everyone so that our response will have full uh, information. The uh, first person, Dennis Clemish. I will ask the, the, the Dennis, before you begin, I will ask um, Cookie Gordon, uh, uh, Deborah Sears, and Mustafa Abdugani to follow. I always wait my two minutes to the first guest speaker. Thank you. Uh, Dennis Clemish, graduate, 1971, Vallejo High School, uh, business owner and resident. Um, my comments are these. Um, I, for the last four years, have been attending Vallejo High School every Wednesday, noontime, to support the Leo's Club. The Leo's Club is a collection of scholastic achievers needing community service in order to satisfy their graduation requirements. That is 12 hours of community service each semester. I have, fortunately, the brightest of the bright of Vallejo High School. All of these students have grade point averages of over 3.4, 3.6, and as high as 4.65. Don't ask me how you can do that, but I guess it is possible. Um, it is a joy to meet with my uh, teacher representative, Miss Elizabeth Troff, in room 77 every lunchtime. They're very prompt in getting there. I have no issues in getting to the classroom. I will tell you that I have been doing this for four years. When I started this four years ago, yes, I was shocked as to the goings on on the campus. There was no less than 30 seagulls flying around over the quad. There was garbage everywhere. The students were not very accommodating in walking on the campus or the sidewalk. Every year it has got continually better, better, and better. And I think the staff is doing a wonderful job 
in looking out for the safety since the campus has been closed and now you even have more people more students on camp on campus in a congested area i don't see any problems whatsoever i am uh, i feel very blessed to be able to provide the service and bring students to outside activities and i have no problem with behavior or control with any of those students. And I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Mustafa Abdulghani, followed by Deborah Sears, followed by Winnie Mims. Good evening. Uh, afternoon, I guess. I guess the first thing I wanted to say is just to preface my remarks. I wanted to say first that anything that I say that may sound like a criticism is, is not and shouldn't be taken that way. It may sound that way, but it's not intended to be a criticism. Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, my intent was just to speak on the first item, which was supposed to be the grand jury report, so I'm just going to talk about that. The other thing I wanted to say was that my, uh, my appreciation of the wisdom, the wisdom of the board when you selected Dr. Bishop to be the superintendent uh, continues. I think she's the right person for the job, and she continues to do a good job. So I want to say that. Well, so what I want to talk about is the fact that I had asked the district. Um, I've talked about safety in the district for some time. And one of the things I asked the district was, if a community member comes to you and asks you about a particular school and asks you, is this a safe school? And you said to them, yes, it's a safe school. And they ask you, how do you measure safety? How do you know it's a safe school? What do you use as a, as, a, as a measuring device? How do you do it? What would you answer them? And I never got an answer back from the district. And, and, and so one of my concerns is, is what we use as a standard for measuring safety. And my concern is this, is that I think it was good that the grand jury made it, gave us this report because they asked this question and it gives us a chance to talk about it and insist that we talk about it. But my concern is that Unless we have a standard for measuring safety that we all use the same standard, anything that we do here is not going to make any difference. Anything that the grand jury has talked about and any action that the district said, is that me? No. Oh, no. Any action that the district says it has taken won't make any difference. And, and I bought my ruler here just to illustrate what I'm talking about. Everybody recognizes this. It's a 12-inch ruler. And you recognize this is a standard that we use in America, all over the world, really, to measure things. And I want you to just imagine in your mind that the board is going to build a classroom. And it's going to have everybody participate in this. It's going to have VEA build a part, and CSEA build a part, and the community build a part. Everybody's going to participate. You're going to have somebody design this classroom and present the design to everyone. And everyone is going to use their own standards because it's before we have standards. And so for some people, they're going to say a foot is when we go from the top of my fingertip to my elbow, and some people are going to say a foot is out here. Different people are going to have different measurements, and they're all going to build their parts. I'm talking fast, and I'm going to get my three minutes in. So then when the pieces all come together, what you're going to find is that nothing's going to fit, even though everybody worked on it. And that's the same problem you have when you don't have a standard that we use for measuring safety. So the first thing I think we need to do is we need to establish in this community what we use as a standard when we measure safety. Now, I know what I use. I know what I think is the standard. Oh, am, I, am I done? Uh, please finish your thought. OK, I know what I use. But I think what we have to do is collaborate, come together, and agree on a standard, and then present that standard to the community. So when the grand jury or anybody is making a report like this, we're all using the same measure. Thank you. Thank you. Deborah Sears. My three minute timer. So, I also uh, provided my comments to the board. There's extra copies if you'd like to distribute them, you can have them afterwards. Okay. My name is Deborah Sears. I'm a parent here in the Vallejo City Unified School District. First, I'd like to thank the grand jury. It's about time we have a spotlight on this issue. Thank you. I'd also like to thank the Vallejo Education Association for their article about wanting listening sessions and training on uh, unconscious bias. Uh, two years behind, but you're finally aligning with the district. Thank you. And to the teachers in the community in the district that started this change two years ago, thank you. You rock. So many goals have been met, many significant gains. 
I like the video on the grand jury. I also research who is the grand jury. We have 19 members of our community, 68% of them white male, 84% of them went to school prior to 1976. So we have a majority of white males over the age of 55 who completed school about 42 years ago or longer. An example of their lens, they use the term Afro-American in this report. This is a very derogatory term that is no longer acceptable in our current social context. I am offended by it. What, what works well with their report? They have many obvious recommendations, no surprises, no shockers. I learned a few things, and about half of their recommendation, easy peasy, lemon squeezy, not a problem. What does not work well for me, old school, been there, done that. I did not like that no parent or student was interviewed for this report. That is unacceptable. I do not like that lack of teacher buy-in and awareness. That is unacceptable. This is interesting, 80% of Vallejo High School teachers live outside Vallejo. Well, recently I was told, until you have lived it, you will never understand it. I think that fits. Nine of the recommendations need funding or other contingencies, either half a million dollars or more. Kind of impractical in our current budget crisis. So, just, uh, what should change? How about cameras in the classroom? How about parents get an app for that? How about adult discipline info on teachers and administrators so I can just click a button and know how many criminals I have of adults in my district? How about a stakeholder safety survey from everyone, a full 360 by an outside agency with objectivity and integrity that really capitalizes on our diverse expertise? How about own our own excellence? Unaware is unacceptable, especially if you are getting a check from the BCUSD. I do not want, ever want to hear another staff person say, I was unaware. It's your job to be aware. And then finally, uphold our values. Every adult, every student, be safe, be respectful, be responsible. Thank you for listening. Before I start, I'd like to know, I, I see these items on the agenda, 3.1, will the people have an opportunity to speak on 3.1, it's, it's a separate agenda item. 3.1 is to review the grand jury report. Yes, Mr. Mims, what we're doing is recommendation by recommendation. So if you want to speak to the overall report, you're standing there at the right time. Or if you want to wait till the end, till you hear everything, you can do it as can well at both? that time. Yes, sir. Oh. For you, anything. Uh, Willie Mims, former teacher, retired educator from, from the Valero Unified School District, former teacher from People's High School, a visitor from the East. I come this day because I know there's trouble brewing over the horizon. I come because I saw your grand jury report and I found it somewhat troubling to me. Uh, my concern was when I read about it in the paper, about the report, I wanted to know who was on this grand jury. Before I read anything, I'd like to know who the players are on the committee. So when I went to the grand, the grand jury section and pull down the players. Uh, you have, and I heard one of the folks mention it earlier, but you have uh, 19 folks on that grand jury. 13 of them are white between the ages of 65 and 74. Uh, one is uh, American Indian, one is African American. Uh, what what I'm uh, getting at here, is that you cannot have a fair and impartial report if you have a, a committee that does not reflect the diversity of your community. You cannot have a fair and impartial report if you have folks who have, may have a hidden agenda. This report to me seemed to have been written by subjective folks who had an agenda. People like me dismiss reports like that, but I am not in your position. I know that you cannot do that, but this is what I do. Um, my concern is uh, not just the report, but it's almost as though the grand jury did not find one thing that this, uh, that Vallejo High School was doing right. 
everything was wrong. And so that tells me that their eyes and limbs were clouded. And perhaps somebody, somebody need to pour water on them. These folks in, on the grand jury, I would suggest that they retire they're, because they're too old to make an, an objective decision. Glale <laughs> High School. Is my time up? No. Glale no. oh. High School uh, under Clarence Isidore. Prior to him, you talk about violence. I retired in, two, in December of 2009. At People's High School, we receive calls all the time about police action on Blair High School's campus. Riots galore. Every day somebody was fighting. Every day the police were there. Now, I don't know if they have the uh, number of contacts. They probably don't because the police were already living on the campus. And so, so that's why you may have more contacts today than you have back then because there was no record of it because the police were already housed on the campus. So, under, I'll stop and come back later. Thank you. <laughs> uh, board members, what is your pleasure? Do you want to comment after each recommendation or do you want to wait to the end? Director Stewart? Yeah, thank you. I, I'm, it's of my opinion that we should be able to speak at any time to any comment. Um, if we want to do it formally at the end of comments for each one, then that's fine. But you know, I think a lot of us are looking for solutions this evening and listening to the comments of the community. But at any given time, I think a board member should feel comfortable to speak. Does any board member care to comment on um, item number one, finding number one, or the recommendation? <laughs> Director Waterman. Thank you. Um, I know that Ernani mentioned that Vallejo High School is working towards systems of better communication. Could we get some insight, please? So as, as we have it now, um, when teachers um, have a situation or any staff member, um, they are to call um, one of the extensions listed, listed above. And uh, you know, one of the main reasons for not having um, two-way radios so accessible is that we need to keep the traffic on those radios to a, a minimum so that when um, real situations arise, the, um, it's not so um, chaotic on the radio. Um, sometimes we have medical emergencies. We have one today, and uh, you know we need to have those lines clear for you know those emergency situations. So um, what we've done is, uh, when my secretary, who's uh, the primary one fielding all the calls, when she goes to break or lunch, she now forwards those calls um, to a, another secretary in the main office. So um, at any given time, uh, someone should be answering the phone. Thank you. I have a question of staff. Um, I do need to say that we are to look at our budget and uh, on, at the, I think that's the June 5th agenda. And I want to know what would the cost be, whether this would be a general fund cost for two-way radios. Who can it? Who can answer that? Lisa Grant Dawson, Chief Business Officer of the School District. Yes, this would be a general fund expense. Um, so in order to allocate radios um, equitably um, to however many areas we need to uh, distribute it to, the radios that are currently purchased now are allocated, uh, the funds are allocated by school site. So for instance, even the elementary school have levels of radio um, communication for emergency and other situations. Those allocations come off from the general fund. Okay, and they come from the site budget? Yes, so the general fund allocates uh, resources to each of the sites and or additional programs. So for instance, site safety as a program department has its own uh, budget as it relates to communication expense. Okay, so then if Vallejo High School wanted to spend their site budget on 
uh, two-way radios, uh, that could be a consideration. It could be, however, the current state of what they are currently spending their budget on, they would not have enough in order to allocate. So this would be an additional allocation okay. that they would need. Um, do you know how much the radios cost uh, per radio? Not off the top of my hand, but I can. Okay, um, that's Mr. information. Tisby is here. Good evening. Um, radios currently cost uh, two hundred fifty dollars per uh, each, each. Okay. How many staff members are there on Vallejo High School's campus? Teachers. Uh, 44 teachers? Seven. Excuse me, 74 teachers. Okay, so that's 74 teachers at $250 a piece. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as I said, we are in the budgetary process right now, and um, I will be asking throughout uh, the evening where there's a cost involved. I will want to know where the budget, where it's coming from, so staff get ready. Um, uh, as you know that um, uh, uh, numbers and uh, finances and uh, audits are what I enjoy looking at. And since we have not adopted the 2014 budget and we will have to make, the, make decisions concerning that, um, this information is very relevant. Director Stewart. Thank you. I wanted to speak with uh, VHS staff as well. Um, the question that I have has to do with uh, the two-way radios as well. Um, the grand jury report in the statements of fact refers to uh, a few, in quotation marks, a few uh, teachers on campus have these two-way radios. Um, and I was curious as to the process we used for determining who would have a radio or not. Um, and also, are these in strategic locations or just kind of at random? Uh, these radios were actually uh, distributed um, prior uh, to this administration. Um, and according to the information that I've gathered, they were put in strategic areas um, near the, one radio I know is near the, in the C building uh, that outlooks uh, Amador Street. Um, one is uh, directly I believe across from the baseball field. So I mean, they they were given out strategically, um, but since uh, this administration team has come on, we have not distributed any radios to any teachers. Okay, thank you. Uh, following up, it also mentioned that at sometimes either there's no one to respond within a campus supervisor office, or if you call the main office, you might receive a student who has to make a tough decision in a potentially stressful situation. Um, is that still the common practice or? So that, that was the, um, what I had alluded to earlier when I, uh, I stated that uh, we've created a system to streamline that process. Mm -hmm. So as it is, as it stands right now, um, our secretary used to go through the security office, but sometimes they take calls and have to leave that office to go field those calls. So if they get a, a call in, say, um, uh, room 75 per se, they have to leave that office. So now um, the calls come to our secretary and if she happens to be on lunch or on break, um, those calls are now forwarded to the main office. So that is the process uh, that we have in place. In addition, we have it uh, set up so that if, let's say a teacher or another staff member were to call the dean's secretary right now and it doesn't pick up in five or so rings it will automatically be transferred to another secretary so we'll always have someone answering the phones in addition students will not answer the phones okay thank you for clarifying that um, <clears throat> just as a basic uh, comment recommendation at this point um, i'm hoping that from site to site and this is going to go for other recommendations and findings that we speak to this evening, that there's communication between sites about best practices and, and what we're doing and making sure works at one site works at another if there's similar conditions. Uh, I'm glad to hear that we're working towards a better process at this time, and I look forward to seeing what we actually end up having in place. Thank you. I have a question. Um, would not two-way radios, are they, um, what happens if a uh, physical education class is out 
uh, on the fields uh, and away from a building where there's a telephone, or even in the in the gym, it would not be logical that they would have a telephone. Uh, our, our PE teachers do have um, two-way radios just for that uh, very purpose. Uh, sometimes they're on the back track um, with, with the walking class, uh, for example, and so they don't have an access to a landline. So that's where the need for the two-way radio would come into play. Um, if, uh, I don't know if, if this ever occurs, but if uh, a teacher is taking their class on a walking field trip on the campus, would they then have access to a, uh, I know some of the uh, academies may go outdoors for some reason, uh, would they then um, have access? Uh, at this current time, they, they do not have access to a two radio. However, we do have site safety supervisors strategically placed throughout the campus and um, at any given time. No matter what area in the camp, uh, campus they may be, there, sh there should be a site safety supervisor there to assist them. Is there any effort by administration to, I, I know that this was, uh, as you've stated, uh, was set up prior to uh, this ad administration and you have obviously made some changes to it, but um, has there uh, been any uh, concern or can we going forward maybe have a design team uh, with all the stakeholders to give input. If we're not able to buy uh, radios for 74 teachers, then maybe a design team looking at where we should strategically place the radios with input from teachers, from students, from staff, from administration working together. Uh, I think that anything for the good of the school community uh, is worthy of having a conversation about. And, uh, you know, through the design team, if, uh, if we could structure some things, I think that's, you know, that's always a possibility. Thank you. Excuse me, Madam President. Oh, I'm sorry. One question. Uh, does the current uh, two-way radio equipment have more than one channel? Yes. Madam President, uh, while uh, Mr. Santos is still there, um, I, I fully agree with uh, uh, President Wilson that, that there ought to be some kind of dialogue within the course, core groups to really discuss what few means. And it, that's too nebulous for me. And what would be adequate and having that design team to discuss that and, and dialogue on coming up with some agreeable numbers to, to feel the sense of safety, I think it's very important. So I, I just want to underline and be supportive of that. Thank you. Yes, I'd be happy to. Thank you. We will now move on to recommendation, I'm sorry, finding and recommendation number two, Vice President Baldy. Madam President, there's currently no City of Vallejo Community Resource Officer or a county probation officer, Vallejo High School, on campus. The recommendation is Vallejo City Unified School District provide a Vallejo Community Resource Officer and a county probation officer for the Vallejo High School campus. Thank you. Vice President Ubaldi, I'm Dr. Shackelford here to speak to recommendation two in regard to solutions to the above mentioned recommendation. Since 2012, it was the endeavor of our superintendent to aggressively pursue grants to address some of the same issues that we recognized early on. And as part of our efforts in applying for grants, we were awarded the Positive Youth Justice Initiative Planning Grant. And so all this school year, we have been in a collaborative relationship with the Solano County Probation, along with Solano County Mental Health and Social Services and Child Welfare, Solano County Office of Education, the Vallejo Faith-Based Community, Kaiser Permanente, UC Davis, and First Five Solano. 
this collaborative is responsible for creating a plan to support our young people that have experienced neglect, abuse, or trauma and are involved in the child welfare system as well as the juvenile justice system. This particular grant has four design elements. One, looking at and understanding positive youth development, understanding trauma-informed care, being able to provide wraparound services for our students, and then our operational capacity, being able to address the school cultures um, on each of our sites. Thank you. Do I have cards on In this order, um, <clears throat> Shayla Bowman Taylor, Pastor Daniel <clears throat> Jefferson, and Cookie Jordan. Pastor Danny Jefferson first. <coughs> Followed by, I'm sorry, Shayla Bowman was the first name of me. Taylor, Pastor Danny Jefferson, and Cookie Gordon. Good evening, everyone. Um, I was actually addressing recommendation one, if that's okay, if I can go yeah. back. Yes, and uh, I will allow Calvin Harrell, who also has one for Cap for number one. If we can quickly get through, this is the last for number one. Yes. I am one of the teachers here at Valero High School that has a radio. Um, so I hear the traffic that goes on on the radio. And just as a personal experience, I understand the recommendation was that all staff has a two-way radio. But when there's emergencies and things on the radio, people can't get through. I think that would be a bigger issue. And then also, um, what constitutes as an emergency? So if everybody had a radio, it could be something that's really minor, but could be on the radio, and that's kind of defeating the purpose if you have something that's really going on that really needs to be addressed. So as far as everyone having a radio, personally, I don't think that would be actually wise um, right now. And maybe strategically placing them other places so people can get to it. Because I know I've had people come up to me if they did not have a radio and say, could you please do this? And that's not an issue. So if everybody's willing to do that, or we could come up with something that could possibly uh, make it a little bit easier. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Calvin Harrell. I'm a member, I was invited to be a member of the design team here at Vallejo High School this year by the new principal, and it's been an honor to serve him, or serve him and the, the community. Um, I sat in on a WASC meeting a few months back, and there was a group of um, former students, uh, current administrators, community members, etc., and it was a love fest. What I heard was that the improvements that have been made at Vallejo High School in the past few years have been tremendous. Interestingly, we moved here as a family about 20 years ago. My daughter went to a private school in Berkeley because we wouldn't put her in a public school. The transitions that have taken place in the positive manner that they've taken place in the past few years that we have observed here at Vallejo High School specifically, which this report addresses, and there's many problems that I see with the report, the transitions that we've seen would give us pause in, or would allow us to consider moving our child into a Vallejo High School or a Vallejo Unified School District rather than paying the tuition that we pay at private schools. That being stated, for all of the recommendations that are here, realism has been thrown out of the window. I kid you not. If you smell a kid with weed, I'm wondering who else is smoking it to dream that you're going to have radios for every teacher. It's not logical. Secondly, in my opinion, where is the comparative data for other schools or institutions with similar demographics in a similar changing environment over the last 20 years? 
Where is the data that supports the recommendations here, other than some some pie in the sky, suburban objective objectives, good students that sit down with their hands crossed, where they have two family households of the primary residences, where the household incomes are such that they can support their kids with extracurricular or after school educational opportunities and other things. We don't have that here in the school. So it's a matter of adapt, adapt, adapt. And I don't see that happening from one side of the table based on this information. I see there's a lot of requests and a lot of directives from the grand jury, but they've not backed it up and said that as a comparison to other schools of similar conditions, your school ranks down low. I work with schools in nine different counties in my business. I don't see Bethel, I don't see Vallejo High School, I don't see any school as bad as some that I see. And I know of no one that releases radios to untrained personnel who have trouble gauging what a problem is or what an emergency is to use on a regular basis. Thank you. Now we're moving to 2.1, to the uh, second final. President Wilson, board members, to Dr. Ramona Bishop, our superintendent, as well as I also like to appreciate uh, Mr. Clarence Isidore, the principal of Vallejo High School. Um, I came to, first of all, say thank you all for the work that you do. Um, I was so proud of you weeks ago when we regained oversight over our own schools. It was a wonderful ceremony and you all have done a stellar job as a group and uh, as a superintendent. I just want to commend you for that and thank you so much for that. Also I'd like to take this time to thank all the faculty and staff and teachers here at Vallejo Senior High School because being a teacher is a very tough job. It's kind of like being a pastor. We all have some hazards uh, in our occupations. But nevertheless, it uh, is something that we are called to do, and I want to thank you for that. I'm here to address recommendation number two. And as I was thinking about this, and actually reading the whole grand jury report, I was thinking about if I could sum up the whole ju grand jury report, and particularly asking for police officers to be on our campuses, and even having county probation on our campuses, we have a, a major problem. Uh, I don't know if you know it, but if you have police officers on your campus and there's an increase of uh, basically, you know, arrest and this kind of thing, uh, then this school would become a pipeline to prison. And we're trying to keep children and young people out of prison not put them in prison. This is an academic institution, and we should not be the ones that are sending them to prison, uh, at least from a wholesale situation. And when I think about the grand jury uh, report, I see the grand jury report as a spider web. In essence, we're asking for police, and we're asking for probation and all of this, but we're not dealing with the root cause. If you're going to get rid of cobwebs, you can clear them all the time, but you have to kill the spider. And what the spider is, 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 in my opinion, is the lack of hope. And when children don't have a lack of hope, I know you can't control what happens after school. I know you can't control the neglect that many of these children are going through. I know you can't control the abuse that they're being subject to at home. I know you can't control the trauma that they're dealing with at home. But the 50 minutes that they're in your classroom as professionals, what this community is expecting of you, I am a parent a pastor and a community member. I'm not just talking, my children are in the district. They ain't in no private school. What we want and what we're demanding and what we're requiring of you is that you prefer, that you not just bring offer, have offices of hope, we need you to be purveyors of hope to, to, to show these children 
that they can't make it. If 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 I don't have hope, guess what? I am gonna smoke weed. I'm gonna do drugs because I have no future. If if I don't have any hope, then I'm going to act in a in a bad way. My behavior is going to be off. We have to provide these children hope, and if we're scared of these children that we're called to serve, then we need to get another profession. I like to ditto everything that I've heard today. My name is Helen Marie Gordon. Yes. I would like to cry, but I take up too much of my time. I've only been given an X amount of time. I'd like to add today, who in the heck gave these people the right to speak for me and my children? Because not one of them asked me. In fact, when I tried to attend a meeting, they stopped me. Told me I wasn't welcome, but it was supposed to be for parents and students for the safety. These people who were in that room was 90% of them were not visitors, was not residents of Vallejo like I am. Recommendation, my foot. 2012, as was pointed out, I've been here since 2005, and I wouldn't even want to step on this campus in 2005. I've seen more gangbangers than I've seen in prison, in juvenile hall, on this campus and outside this school. Yes, there is problems here. Everyone knows how I have some problems. I've seen things that shouldn't have been here at this school. I see our kids go through hardship. But I'd rather be to here in 2005 than I was here in the 1980s. Someone said they put the school here in 1980. There was a shooting and a stabbing. Where I didn't see that reported next to her name. I'm not allowed to say the name. Going forward, I have seen so much difference in this school. And yes, every one of these people know I still have problems. I have problems with a lot of teachers not doing their job. I've been here every other Wednesdays, and I don't see those problems. A fight took place, not one teacher was there. But let me just tell you something. You see this right here, everybody? This is something that I attend personally. And not one educator was there, that, to my knowledge. This school don't need probation officers. They're going to see that in juvenile hall. They're going to see that stuff already. When I, I want my son to come to school and know he, he is making a difference in his life by coming to school. And now he lost hope because teachers lost hope on him. Okay. And I want to thank you so much. Your time is up. No, I got one minute. You have one minute. Yeah, now. Look. <laughs> Should I get an extra minute for this? <laughs> I will give you an hour. Thank you. I respect and understand. I, I'm proud that they did this, because we all need evaluations, right? But be accurate, please. Be, tell the truth, don't make it just only for them. And when I see safety, I respect teachers. I, I, I love teachers, my father would whoop me if he caught me disrespecting a teacher, even at this my age. But the fact of the matter goes is our teachers are not teaching that same thing back to us parents and back to the students. The students don't feel welcome to their own school. And I'm just asking, when we make recommendations, please consider how they talk to any of our children and how they feel today. Thank you. The visitor from the East, Mr. Willie Mills. Somewhat caught off guard. Uh, that sit, that uh, setup you guys got there, that's real nice. I didn't really know what was going on, but now I know. So I, got, I have my share of speaking cards, I'll tell you that. Uh, you know, uh, I wasn't prepared to speak on this item, but since I'm up here, I don't want to leave. Uh, the, uh, I think that, you know, when, when you have a grand jury that makes a uh, 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 recommendation, like this, to have police officers and probation officers on the campus, it's almost as though the grand jury itself were looking at the students as criminals. <laughs> so that, that, that was the uh, message that came out to this report. So I would, you know, Blaine High School is not, is not the only school that has problems. But I'll tell you what, 
In 2009-2010 school year, there were over almost 2,000 suspensions from this school itself. Now, under, under the, the leadership of Clarence Isidore, that has come down in about the four or five hundreds. But that was, that was, that was in 2009-2010. Uh, but, so, if, it, if you only had about four or five hundred suspensions this past school year, what was it like in 2009-2010? Was that not a chaotic, dangerous campus? I mean, if you had 2,000 sus suspensions, I mean, and that was that year, but the year before that, it was almost 2,000 again. And so, I'm somewhat uh, baffled by the people who complain to the grand jury. I don't think that they were being upright, truthful, and fair. I think that they were being unfair to, to Mr. Clarence Isidore and what he had done for this campus. But, you know, that's my personal opinion. Anyway, thank you. Dr. Bishop, I'd like to say something. We have no more yellow cards, and then we'll go to the board. Thank you. Just quickly. Just quickly. Can you hear me? Yes. Quickly? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. I'd like to bring Dr. Um, Latanya Durbany to the mic to just piggyback on what was said in public comment um, regarding a call that we got from the Office of Civil Rights. And then I'll ask, um, then I'll turn it back over to President. Um, good evening, board and community. Um, Dr. Latine Durbany, Director of School and Student Accountability. And sitting over to my left, the audience's right, are two of our visitors from the Office of Civil Rights. In 2010, our district was under investigation for the disproportionate suspension and expulsion of African American male students um, within our district. What was found in, and although there's not an actual finding because it's not resolved, we are still working with the Office of Civil Rights to address this very huge problem. Um, we also know that we were one of the top ten in the state in terms of our fever or the, the well, how well we suspend kids. So we, we know that this is a problem. And some of the data that they've collected, although we, we don't have any findings, so I want to make that very clear, but some of the data that's been collected has been um, the need for certain interventions, most of which we have in place, or we've just now put into place. Things like culturally responsive instruction, things like positive behavior interventions. There was, and there was, in our data, and we know this because this came not only from the Office of Civil Rights, but also from the report um, that we just reviewed last year, that we have a suspension problem, and we do have a, a pipeline problem. Thank you. Board members. <coughs> Director Stewart. Does anyone have a comment on this one? I do. Um, how much does a resource officer cost? Someone? And answer how um, campus supervisors, how many campus supervisors or site safety officers can I have for that amount of money? So at the time that the Vallejo City and School District had a contract with the City of Vallejo, um, the contract allowed us to pay for, we had grants to pay for a portion of a resource officer, and then we were paying um, all of a resource officer at our secondary school. So at the time, our average cost, based on the amounts that were stated, were over $100,000. That included their salary plus their benefits. So with those contractual provisions, at the time, we had five active resource officers of my, six resource officers of my recollection um, serves me well. In addition to that, we also had those same and additional resource officers who would also attend our high school uh, athletic events. They would attend football games, um, they would attend 
basketball games, girls basketball games, in a number of six to eight a night. So that was in addition to that cost. So as it relates to that, for one, um, not having that recent data on their salaries, at least $100,000. Okay. How, for $100,000, could I employ more than one site safety officer? Yes. How many could I employ? Uh, <laughs> So uh, 3.5 based on salary with their benefits, um, on top of that, it would be... 3.5. Mm -hmm. Okay. What would happen if something happened in the community and a resource officer is on campus and something happens in the community? Uh, Mr. Jordan, could you have, help me here? Um, what would happen as far as would the resource officer remain on campus or would he go into the, the event in the community? Yes, thank you. I'm Mel Jordan, Assistant Superintendent of uh, Human Resources and Maintenance and Facilities. Uh, what would happen is that that officer would be pulled away. That's, that would be a high, the high priority is the community first uh, for the school. So they would leave the campus. They would leave the campus. Okay. So, but then did we reduce that from the salary and are we allowed for the contract to reduce that time away no, from? No, we would be paying the same amount of money. Okay, so I could get maybe 3.5 um, site safety officers. Uh, here at Vallejo High School, and I'm an advocate for not having a cookie cutter approach on our campuses. Jesse Bethel is a more, more recently built high school. It's built more contained than the Vallejo High School, what is 150 years old or whatever, and so it's more open. Let me ask you this. How many site safety officers are there at Jesse Bethel, and how many are there on two campuses at Vallejo High School? Okay, at Vallejo High School here, we have nine site safety uh, Supervisors, and I believe that uh, just about have eight. Okay, that is illogical to me because if you have two campuses, and this is a campus that's two campuses and more open, um, there I want us to specifically look at acquiring perhaps more site safety officers and to distribute them according to the campus's need. This is two campuses versus one campus. The other thing that I want to look at, and I am a part of this neighborhood, I am a part of the Vista Neighborhood Association, <laughs> um, and I do want to say that our neighborhood association uh, our president sends out numerous emails about the schools. I will say that over the last year, he has sent very positive emails concerning about the responsiveness of Principal Isidore and the staff here. And, I, and those are emails, not altered. I can provide the uh, documentation. But I do want us to investigate closing Nebraska Street, doing business hours, doing school hours. <coughs> the model that you might want to look at, this isn't anything new, Pittsburgh High School. I've been on their campus where they're divided by a street. Check that out, see whether that's an alternative to uh, providing additional support and safety for Vallejo High School. And also, uh, additional site safety officers and where they're placed on campus in zones perhaps to look strategically to ensure that all uh, areas of the campus are covered so maybe teachers can will know who's assigned to their area so that they can immediately have access to that site safety officer. Uh, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Director Munson. Uh, one other thing, I do appreciate the uh, 
Positive Youth Summit. I did attend it. Director Stewart also attended the majority of it. And what I liked about it is that probation was at the table with us. And probation, mental health, uh, we had judges in the room, including the presiding judge for this grand jury. And the uh, 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 information concerning uh, post-traumatic stress disorder that students may be experiencing. It opened my eyes to a lot of things, and I was a foster parent forever. So uh, I think that uh, alternatives and the things that we're looking at are very helpful. But I also think that with the thoughts that I uh, have given out concerning the street and everything, I would want, again, the A design team with all the stakeholders to have input into this and uh, to uh, uh, give us some thought as to how best to do this. And including students, teachers, staff, everybody, parents. Whatever we do tonight, we need to do it as a family. Thank you. Two more on recommendation two. David Mohammed, followed by, well, Lori Takmar. I think that's right. At this time, I would like to present David Mohammed. Um, David Mohammed comes to us by way of the Positive Youth Justice Initiative Planning Grant. He is one of the many experts that is supporting the district's efforts in learning more about positive youth development. What I talked about earlier is one of the design elements, and I'm going to have him come at this time to speak. Good evening to the community, to the superintendent, to the board members of the Clay Elder High School District. I, I came to speak uh, briefly about the Positive Justice Initiative and, and just to say uh, my name is David Mohammed and I've uh, been the director of juvenile justice and probation systems in Washington, D.C., New York, and here in California. And I'm currently uh, run a, a consulting firm, uh, and the Sierra Health Foundation has asked me and a few others uh, to help the six jurisdictions that are a part of this. Uh, initiative uh, to be a more positive justice initiative, and Dr. Shackelford, I think, talked a little bit about this initiative earlier. And the big part of this is to try to help transform systems, primarily probation systems, are the, the leads uh, in most of the counties. Uh, there's a very unique and innovative county, Solano, where the, the Valeria Unified School District is the lead. Uh, to move systems, child welfare systems, juvenile justice systems away from the traditional correctional deficit-based models and into more progressive um, uh, strength-based, asset-based models. Uh, and so we're helping with tools and with uh, training and with resources to move these systems to one that builds on young people's strengths and assets and not just focus on their deficits uh, and their challenges. And this has been shown through a lot of research to be most effective when dealing with young people who are engaging in delinquent behavior. Uh, and so we're working hand in hand with probation departments who are at the table, who are engaged. Uh, we are really trying to stop uh, what has nationally been called the school to prison pipeline, uh, which is a challenge all over the country and which is rightfully uh, taken on by strength-based approaches. Uh, one such strength-based approach that is being done in several school districts around the country is positive-based interventions and supports. Uh, that is one that uh, we support, and as we look at probation departments and child welfare departments, again, building on the young people's assets and their strengths, engaging young people and their families in their own case planning process, uh, and putting resources in the community and in the neighborhood and in the family uh, so that young people can continue to thrive and succeed. Uh, and so I certainly can answer any questions about the initiative. Uh, I must say that as we've had a planning year and we're going to go into implementation, there's six counties involved, four will be selected to move forward into a $400,000 giving away uh, things with the foundation of Lay Unified School District has been a huge piece in the Solano uh, uh, proposal uh, and have been one of the best performers in this initiative thus far. And so we are, is that 
<laughs> we are um, uh, we're happy uh, to partner with the Blair Unified School District, the Solano County uh, Probation Department, the Solano County Health and Human Services Agency, and with their child welfare system. Uh, and it, it, it is a challenge to work toward building young people's strengths and assets and, and building systems uh, that for too long have been deficit-based, which have caused more delinquency uh, rather than more success. Uh, and so with that, I'll certainly take any questions that folks may have or, or be around to uh, take Thank you very much. So as I'm sitting in the back of the room, I'm thinking about what people are saying and I'm hearing them. My mother was a sheriff for 29 years, narcotics. My uncle works for Petaluma. My aunt works for Petaluma Police. My cousin works for Contra Costa. My family works for Vacaville. We are in the police system. That is what I believe. My aunt is the assistant district attorney for Marin County. Laws. I didn't make the laws. I didn't write them. I may have voted for them. I may not have voted for them. We have laws for a reason. Drug use, stealing, vandalism, theft. I understand we're not doing a pipeline to prison. I understand that's what we want to avoid. There are rules for a reason. There are rules to avoid chaos. There are rules so we can get the systems working. I'm hearing, oh no, oh no, we don't want this on our campuses. Oh no, but we have to have systems. We have to have systems in place. We have to have systems in place that help our system to be successful. If we don't get systems in place, we can't teach. You can't teach a child who's stealing out of your drawers. Oh, I'm sorry, wait, wait, I gotta stop 30 kids over here, but I'm gonna help the child over here. Okay, we can't teach children who are coming in stoned after lunch. We have to do something about the elephant. There is a drug problem in our high schools. There is alcohol problem. There is a lot of difficulties in saying, oh no, you know, we, we, we gotta work with them, I agree. But you have to get the systems in place in order to work with them. So I think we need to be open. I, I, I appreciate the gentleman who just spoke about some of his systems, but I don't think that ignoring the problems or not acknowledging them or saying that we're not going to deal with them really works. So I'd like to acknowledge that we have these problems on our campus, that our teachers are dealing with them every day, and that it's not something we can just bury under sand. We cannot stick our head in the sand and say, oh, no, you know, they have a bad home life, they're doing drugs. It doesn't work that way. That's not what our law says. That's not what our court system says. And that's not how we are successful as a system. Thank you. Um, we will go on now to um, recommendation uh, finding number three. Director Stewart. Finding number three states, there are several locations on Vallejo High School campus that are not secure and easily accessible by intruders. The grand jury recommendation is that Vallejo Unified School District install adequate fencing on Vallejo High School campus to secure the campus. Yes, thank you again. Uh, Mel Jordan, Assistant Superintendent of uh, Human Resources, Facilities and Maintenance. Um, this is uh, design work at uh, Vallejo High uh, for the fencing started early 2012 and the installation of the work gave and followed that. And in doing that, before the installation occurred, we met with uh, the uh, parent network, we met with uh, students, uh, students uh, sites, uh, student council, uh, to ensure that the work that we were doing was one that if there was any other additional um, information that, that we could hear to make the fencing uh, one that we were really uh, concerned about was that it was pleasing. It, the fence was really established to control um, access points. It was really studied really hard. It was also 
um, created um, a real transparent means of a boundary. Um, we, we started uh, a lot of this back um, prior um, to Vallejo High. There was, there was a plan. We did it at Hogan first uh, to basically make sure that what worked there would work here. So again, this is a, a, a means that all the access points have a clear uh, means of control. It provides our site safety supervisors a mean to be able to look at those access points and not have to look at the entire uh, perimeter of the site. So again, uh, this uh, was installed in the summer of 2012. Thank you. We have speakers, Raymond Johnson, followed by Cookie Dory. Speaking personally, as an AP student, because of budget cuts like Tequia, we had to pay for our own AP test this year, and that's like $89. And which, by the way, our staff did a really good job with like Ms. Madsen. She was in charge of that, and she provided a lot of resources. So our staff does actually care about us, if you guys are wondering. Um, <laughs> I apologize, I didn't acknowledge the board, and I, please forgive me, to, to Dr. Ramona Bishop, our superintendent, and Madam President, and the board members. Uh, I just want to make sure, are they referring to this before we actually got our fence up? Are they saying that needs to be more fenced? So, I had, when I sat on the school site council, and we voted for this, it cost a lot of money, and we had, a lot of the parents' questions were safety, like if there was an emergency, how will kids get out? You know, um, we know we don't want people to come in. Remember, you worked here where there was no fence. And we were concerned that if there was an emergency, how would people be able to get in and access? Um, I know when we came here in a cab, <laughs> the man had to like go up in there, go around, and it was very difficult and he almost hit a kid. So. I just want to know, are we trying to actually create a safety place or we want our kids to see what juvenile hall really looks like on the outside? My concern is if we do all what we're talking about, it no longer feel like a school environment. I don't see Bethel have that as a problem and they're a big campus. I almost lost myself there. But my concern is what more can we do to say this is safety? I think. Personally, um, having people at those areas is needed. I love the idea of closing uh, Nebraska. You remember, I was the number one for supporting of that. Um, and having more uh, people at places that that's what we want to do. Uh, I, I just want to know how much defense do we need? That's what I'm asking. Thank you. <laughs> several places. I find that the response does not really address the entire issue. Very clearly in the piece, VHS is a closed campus. The recently installed wrought iron fence secures only the front of the campus. You're talking about what they're talking about. So if the recommendation 
is that there is a need for more fencing. This does not address the recommendation. Now, maybe there is a need, maybe there is not. But I'm really feeling like, I hate to say it, that some of this is manipulative. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was our last card. Mr. Joy. Now, I'm on the Vallejo Ice campus almost daily. Prior to the fence going up, I saw you walking the campus with the Vallejo police officer. Was that to provide input concerning the fencing around the campus, or were you guys doing something else? It was a collaborative effort. What it was, I met with the officers. Um, they knew that we were doing a fencing project. It would, we worked, walked through the entire site where all the points where we would be putting fences where they would recommend. So what you see is what um, the, Vallejo, the Vallejo City, City of Vallejo Police Department recommended when we were walking through the sites, and we, we met all those conditions. Okay. I, I just wanted to make sure that that's what's happened, that is, is what happened, because I did witness that myself. Um, they said the fence is only around the front. I thought there was fence on the uh, Amador Street side also. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a fence along Amador. Okay, I'm not quite sure now. Uh, I need help. Again, there's access points. There's the, the building. That, uh, the building itself would not have a fence because the building acts as a fence. What a lot of the fencing that was placed was placed not only to provide um, the intent of you know access points, but also we wanted to be really aware of the architectural element of the neighborhood as well, making sure that it was a, a pleasing, acceptable, just like your house, you know, a nice fence. Well, it's, uh, safety is, um, is uh, you know, the number one concern here. I do want to know um, if we, I guess I need further clarification of where the additional fencing needs to be installed. If, because it's on the Amador Street, it's on the Nebraska Street side. Um, so if there is, is a need for additional fencing, um, I again ask you to um, consult with um, Vallejo PD, maybe again, and maybe they've had a change of heart, or maybe uh, somehow, so that we can get a, um, an idea of where this additional fencing needs to be um, because, and I also, again, as part of the design team, ask that we get input from all the stakeholders and maybe get a better understanding on this particular item. Um, and again, I recommend blocking off, uh, at least investigate the Nebraska Street uh, situation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, two students that I have, uh, don't have cards for, Benjamin, Terry and Merrick here. Um, good afternoon, uh, school board. My name is Benjamin Terry, and I'm a senior here at Vallejo High School. Um, I was just wondering, I had a couple of questions. The first question is why did we even install a fence in the first place? Um, it seemed like I heard that it was a lot of money, that it was, it took a lot to make it, and it's now just sitting there not doing, really, it's not doing its purpose at all. And I'm wondering why that money wasn't used to do something more productive, like um, advance my education, or, um, or also put security cameras in there, or something. Um, I also wanted to, um, I've been listening for these, this past hour and a half, and, I've, and I heard some things about how um, it's wrong to call this place, to call the people in this place criminals. Um, through my four years of high school, I've seen people, and I've heard stories of people using drugs, doing vandalism, you know, all this really bad stuff. And as far as I know, that's against the law. 
it's a, a criminal offense to do those things. And people who commit criminal offenses just happen to be criminals. So, unfortunately, unfortunately that's true, but um, I'm just wondering why, why are we downplaying this? Um, this is a really, this is an issue here at school. These people, they committed the crime and now they sort of have to do the time. Thank you. Um, good afternoon to all attendants. Uh, my name is Mary Gira and I am a proud student of the graduating 2013 class. <laughs> So, in, I'm addressing um, recommendation three. Uh, in 2012, in the 2011 and 2012 school year, um, a class of mine, uh, many students, in our, several students in our class felt threatened, um, and actually an event took place, and our lives, and not only the lives of our teacher, were actually put in danger when an intruder decided to walk in our class and not only threatened us, but our own teachers' lives. And um, obviously we were scared. Um, and um, he, was, he was apprehended, thankfully. And then in the summer of 2012, the fence was installed. Um, the fence has done its work. Um, I've seen a bottleneck of, of um, I'm sorry, a bottleneck of people coming in, but it, it has slowed down, the traffic has slowed down. There are not as much intruders, but there are still intruders, and that is what I'd like to address, is that it's done part of its work. It's not done its full amount of work. And I understand that they want to build more fences, but seeing the cost of this current fence, um, I would recommend not only, not, not more fences, but help for the supervisors that are supposed to supervise the fence, not, and also the teachers that are supposed to supervise the streets, who have views of the streets, views of, uh, entrances onto the campus, they need help, and we know they need help. And the students know they need help because the students, not all students, are, um, how do I say this? Um, in contradiction to my friend Ben, not all students are criminals. I'd just like to point that out. There are a handful of us that are proud to graduate, and we would like to see our staff and our faculty get the help that they need. So, um, thank you. Director Waterman, thank you. Well, I'd like to first make a comment. I think it's just been proven that it's a real shame that the grand jury did not interview any of our students. That's right. Thank you. And the importance of having students as part of the design team is clear, because I think they know best the terrain of their environment. And I'm very happy to hear about our proud graduates, and I can't wait to, um, to be a graduation vibe. Um, and so I wonder what the term adequate means. I guess I'm posing the question. And I look forward to, as uh, Mustafa suggested, we get a clear metric and not a vague recommendation so that if there is truly something for us to address, we can, because the spirit is there. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, my other question, of course, is um, we, we will need to know cost. First, we need to know where, what additional fence, and then we do need to know cost. And that's, I'm assuming that's a general fund uh, matter, because we are going into the budget process. We are rapid growth. Okay. Um, number four, Mr. Mumpson. Good evening. Thank you, Madam President. Um, finding number four, there are blind spots on the Vallejo High School campus that our surveillance cam cameras cannot observe. And the grand jury's recommendation was that Vallejo City Unified School District upgrade the surveillance cameras on the Vallejo High School campus. Uh, again, uh, thank you. Um, the surveillance cameras um, were introduced in this site um, back in uh, 2009, and uh, what this was, it was really studied uh, very carefully, and what type of coverage um, would, would be sufficient, or at least 
working collaborative with the other elements that we have, and that's with our site safety and with the fencing. There isn't um, any uh, blind spots coming into the site at all. And what happens, there's areas within the site that obviously once you're in, this, in the center, there's some areas that you would not be able to see, but it would be covered by the other areas that we have where there's site safety or there would be access of um, staff that would also be able to see it because it, that's where the circulation is. This is taking care of all the areas that would be uh, any intruders or anything, activities that would be happening on the site where adult present wouldn't be there um, um, uh, uh, continuously. So again, um, this was put back in 2009, it was part of the phase one, not only that school was done, but all high schools were done at the same time. Thank you. I have yellow cords. Um, Judith, learning. Followed by Tyree Ramont and Cookie Doyle. Judith? Okay, sorry. I think this is fine. All these are fine. I'm sorry we had the wrong box. There are no cards on four, so could be going. So yes, you're going to see me on all because I, I like how you have a breakdown. It gives you less time for it, all of them. So on um, a day that my son decided that um, he wanted to be a teenager. Um, and be nosy at a fight, he was told, said that he had left the campus through the radio, and that's one of the reasons I agree with um, not everyone having a radio, because everyone had a radio, and it was last said that my son walked off the school campus. And you can believe you and me, that was a Wi-Fi that I didn't want to get. But however, my, with working with Mr. Santos and I, we found Charles, every step of the way. He did not leave the campus. He went from the office, he went from the office to the gym, and then when he got my note to come home, he then went to report and checked out of school. We saw that, not via the radio, we saw that because the radio was saying that he left the campus. But because of Mr. Santos and I was able to track him via camera all the way. I'm talking about from the office, from the, from the side here to the office, to the gym, until he actually left the school campus. Back to the office and then up to the school campus. So I'm not sure just how much more these people were looking at. And I don't, live, I don't work here, but I just confirmed with Mr. Santos, it did help him. So I just, I'm not sure exactly how much camera, but I know we had sacrificed a lot of funds, parenting funds, resources, a lot of program that I was against necessarily to make sure that our cameras were upgraded. And I can't guess how much upgrade we can get unless we just have an actual satellite right above us. That's all I'm just saying. I, I'm just not sure just how much more we, we need to do. Thank you. And like the kids said, we're taking from their education. I mean, how much more we need? That's all I want to know. Thank you. Mallory Walton. Work. Um, I am alumni of Leo High, and I also work here, and I just want to um, make sure that this is um, being said about the blind sites here at the school. There are numerous of campus supervisors that do roll. There's also a great um, administrative that I have seen. My office is facing the quad, big window, finance office, and I do see Santos and a bunch of administrators, even as a door on a cart, roving around um, school. Um, it's kind of hard, it's not like we're in a casino where we can see everything going on. As we know, this is a very open campus. Um, but with the cameras that we do have, 
Um, I also do work site safety every once in a while, I know, but with the rovers that we have, we call them rovers who ride around school on golf carts, um, that we do have, I do believe that it's the best possible um, supervision that we can have amongst high school kids. I guess, could we add more cameras? Yeah. Would they be effective than what we have right now? I guess. I think it'll just be necessary spending money. But I just think that us as faculty need to make sure at ourselves to see if we're doing every possible thing that we can do. Because are we greeting our kids at the door? Are we communicating with our kids every day? Um, that there can suppress a lot of the issues that we do have to provide safety for our kids. Um, back to the basics, like you said, every person on campus is responsible for kids' success here. And I just feel like um, more campus supervisors, I think we're just doing all that we can do here. So basically what I'm suggesting the recommendation number four is that the blind spots are being um, rectified with the people that we have on campus, campus supervisors roving the campus every day. Just if people don't know. Sorry. Thank you. Comments about board members. Um, I'm not sure as to what this means about camera upgrades, whether it's concerning the quality of the picture, uh, the locations, etc. Um, what I will suggest is, be, uh, again, a budget item, so we want to make sure that if we're going to add or if there's something that we need to do, uh, that we listen to uh, those who, um, uh, uh, that part of the design team, our safety design team, that all the stakeholders, so that we can get a better understanding as to what is looking. Now, the blind sites, so, uh, spaces in the, uh, uh, areas, or whether they're sufficiently covered by uh, site safety officers, uh, I don't know. But we do need to uh, look at it. Now, as far as the quality of the pictures, um, I think that this would be a time, a great time for, um, I see up, up here that there was a, uh, that we must have some confidential video, and that we take uh, that video to the Vallejo Police Department and have them look at it uh, and assess uh, whether or not that video reflects what it was, uh, whatever it was supposed to reflect. So uh, have the Vallejo Police Department give us some idea after they have reviewed this video. And um, I want us to provide a link to the video along with any report to the grand jury so that, uh, and when I say link, I mean so that they could push a button, look at the video, because I'm not sure did they, did they, if they even looked at any video. They're talking about us upgrading video, a surveillance cameras. So if the picture, if we don't, um, uh, if the picture is not of the quality where they feel the report is substantiated, by the picture, then um, we need to get their input as to uh, what type of surveillance cameras we need. Or if if the ones we have are adequate, well, we need to space it. But I think that it's important that if we have some video, that we give the a grand jury a link to that video, whatever report that needs to go with it, and have them look at it. I am saying a redacted report a redacted report. So names are removed um, and a stamp over the face of the parties so that we can use this as training. And in fact, this should be uh, something that could probably be used by the uh, Law Academy up to just enough of high school uh, in the uh, future. So uh, let's, uh, we have this great expense, so let's utilize it for training, for uh, uh, teacher training, staff training, site safety officer training, let's um, uh, take advantage of this opportunity since we've spent the money. Thank you. There's Madam one Madam more resident. Oh, sorry. I just have a, I have a quick question about the last two uh, findings. Did the grand jury uh, provide us with an aerial map 
or some sort of campus map with circles around where these blind spots are and where these open parts of the face is? Do we have anything concrete from the grand jury about what they assert is uh, problematic? Not that I know, but I, I'll tell you the documentation, if it was asked for, um, you'll see three documents. You'll see a document that shows the video camera's coverage, which is really, it's, it's actually substantial. It covers everything. Then with our site safety coverage that we currently have, it shows all the coverage that that's occurring, so there's an overlapping piece there. And then the fencing piece also shows how that's all controlled. And as far as um, uh, the cameras, um, we were pretty much ahead of the curve on a lot of our camera system. In fact, the city of Vallejo is catching up with us. In fact, they have just recently gained access to our cameraing system as well, so they actually have access to our system so that they, they can actually observe um, as uh, they, they uh, have any intel information that they need. They can observe the activities. It's really what the activities are leading up to, any kinds of incidences. So they have full access to that. So again, it's, it, uh, if that information was, uh, that, that information if it was asked for, or if they, they should have asked for it, if they didn't ask for it, because it's, it's clear, the documents show how much coverage is on this campus. It's almost blanketed. Thank you. But again, if, if there is a feeling uh, somebody reported this and if there's a feeling again I, I really feel that the safety design team should be looking at it to give us what their feeling is and what they're thinking as to uh, what it is so that we can properly address it. And, and what's, excuse, what's important about that is that this system is a living uh, a living system in other words that information that is provided if there's any of those kinds of concerns this system could adjust. Okay thank you um, again, that would be a general fund item, so um, if you want to, if you're going to make, um, spend some money, you need to know that. Um, Brooks, Miss Brooks, Rhea Brooks, thank you. I just wanted to address, um, I'm a counselor at the ninth grade acute um, community, mm -hmm. and there's no cameras at all on our site. So we are one campus, there's probably more adequate cameras on this side of the campus, but not on ours. Okay. 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 That then it, uh, makes uh, sense, and this is the information that we need, uh, because we are, that's the purpose of this forum, for us to understand what is being questioned so that we can hear the full picture. So thank you. So uh, uh, I know that at the time, that side was a middle school and we were doing the high schools. And I don't know what the schedule is for the, um, Mr. Jordan, do you want to? Wonderful question. Um, we're basically ahead of that one. That, that project on the Loyal Ninth Grade Campus is already designed. In fact, it's scheduled for this year. Again, it all comes down to the, I call it the Benjamin, you know, getting the resources in front of us to be able to get it there. But we already have a design already ready to, uh, to take care of that, that side of the campus. But at that time, it was a middle school rather than a high school. Thank you. Thank you. Rolanda Molex. My name is Rolanda Mullick. Um, I was a 2007 graduate of Loyola High School, proud graduate. Um, I know uh, just being a recent former student, I, there was times walking in certain classrooms where I didn't feel welcome. And if I wasn't the person that I was, then I wouldn't have been welcome to endure the education that that teacher was trying to offer to me. Also. So, <coughs> Instead of asking for fences, surveillance cameras, what about some workshops for the teachers on how they can improve safety within their classroom or how they can construct their, their classroom more efficiently? Um, I mean, I know, you know, these teachers work so hard and they love their jobs, but I just feel like teaching is something that it's a lifestyle, it's not just a job. And if these teachers could come together and have these workshops and get information from each other and feed off of each other, they can be more efficient in the classroom. 
instead of asking for all these things that are going to cost us all these money, these workshops, these workshops are free. We just somebody just has to have the ability to construct them, put them together. That's all I have to say. Just to piggyback off of that, um, there are some books in the front uh, published by Public Council, and I'm not sure if Public Council is still here present. Um, Ms. Omojala, are you still here? Okay. But at any rate, um, it talks about Vallejo City Unified and the work that we're doing under positive behavior intervention support and restorative justice. And our webinars are free. We're being asked to do statewide training because of the work that we have going on around these research-based initiatives. And thank you, <laughs> the one clap. And, <laughs> and so if anybody would like a toolkit, um, they're there for the public. I believe that Sarah brought 100 copies. And Sarah, just wave your hand in case anybody should want to talk with you. Sarah is an attorney at law who actually was the um, writer of a lot of this work. So if you want one, um, feel free to grab one that's free at your disposal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, finding five, Director Water. Uh, finding five, Vallejo High School student handbook states that all students will visibly wear photo identification badges while on campus. And the recommendation? Vallejo High School administration enforced the policy that all students must visibly wear their identification badges while on campus. Good evening, Director Wilson, President Wilson, Board of Directors, Dr. Ramona Bishop, members of our community, teachers, faculty, and staff. My name is Clarence Sizzler. I'm proud principal of Vallejo High School. First and our PBIS and our design teams, along with our administration, will review the recommendations and match with board policy and update our student handbook. Thank you. We have court. Judith. The dear learner. I'm sorry. So good evening, everybody, especially um, community. Thanks for coming out and um, joining us here. Um, I think IDs are great. I think it makes a lot of safety, but I would beg you all not to try to enforce a policy like this when you don't have the resources to do it. Um, we've been, I'm, I'm, I'm a teacher at Hogan Middle School now. I was previously a teacher at Hogan High School, and we've tried this before. Um, it's, it's policy, right? We've, we're now at Hogan Middle School trying to do school uniforms. We started out the school year trying to enforce that. What happens is, is if you do not have the resources to do that, and I'm talking about people resources, not just buy-in, but resources. What do you do when you don't have compliance? What do you do when a kid shows up without the ID? And the problem is, if you don't have the resources to do it, then the kids who don't wear the ID become a majority, and they start picking on the kids who are following the rules. The kids all learn that the administration cannot enforce rules that have to do with safety. And the kids who are rule followers get picked on. They get called nerds, and it's very disruptive, and it sends exactly the wrong message. It makes things less safe and not more safe. So unless you really, really can do it, please don't say you're going to do it and then not do it. Thank you. Ramon, Cookie Gordon, and Calvin Gray. Tyree. Um, 
me as a student, I don't see why we would have to visibly wear identification cards because, <laughs> because like this year we got our ID cards, but we didn't even get a lanyard like we have in the previous years. And like not only that, some teachers would not let us go into class if we didn't have it. It makes no sense because it's taken away from our education because the teachers have to send us away to go get a new ID card and like it costs money to <coughs> to fund these ID cards. Um, I, my cousin, he left his ID card at home and he dropped it and he had to walk to school. So if he had to walk to school and we were ordered to wear our ID cards, then like they would send him away from getting his education. Like we have honors classes, so like that's taken away from the time that they have to teach us to do our work. And yeah, like if you send the children away from the classrooms, then they'll be on in the hallways and then they'll most likely be out smoking or drinking or whatever they do with their friends. And yeah, that's all. Cookie Gordon, followed by Calvin Harrell. Thank you. Yes, I do feel somewhat this is important. However, um, I did all the concerns with the young man just mentioned, and I've seen it happen time and time out where the kid gets to school, into the class on time, and then have to spend five hours trying to look for his ID or her ID, and then be stuck in a situation where he's trying to turn his work or she's trying to turn her work in and cannot do so. Um, when my son here was here in 2005 and 2006 and 7, um, he would lose his ID badge and, and honors class, as he just mentioned, and also AP classes, um, and they wouldn't let him in the classroom. And then when he finally found it in his gym bag at the bottom, whatever, um, they wouldn't let him in the class because then he was truant. He had to go get a note. So by the time he actually could not uh, get his diploma initially, uh, when it was in the danger zone, it was $105 fees. Because they charged $5, $5, and then, then it was additional more monies um, each time you need another badge. So I say, don't get mad at me, students. Get uniforms. Because nobody can just all, you know, people, these kids, they, look, they was in the community, somebody, man, I gotta go get back, get my uniform on. You know, because we all know, you know, where these kids belong when they wear uniforms. So I think that's more cost efficient to the parent, but uh, it's better than my, our kids being late to class. So I, and I also want to say, if you want your students to wear ID vests, teachers, you need to do the same thing. I don't even know a, a teacher or who is working in school and don't work in school. So if we're going to enforce it, let's be the first examples. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I did tell you, so please call you up to me. Calvin Morrell. Um, with a little experience here, first and foremost, you have a plan with 2,000 people, with an extraordinarily diverse population. And if you don't have the leaders, and I'm speaking to the teachers, to buy in on what may be or sounds like is already a board or a district policy, or a school policy, or a handbook policy, that everyone must have an ID card, you have, you've got to start at ground zero. Teachers are the first line of defense. What happens in their environment with relation to ID cards on the students is, is they have to see them. No, you cannot kick a child out of class. That's an absolute wrong approach. But you can give the child a temporary badge. It could be a sticker. You can record the number on that badge that, that you keep as a recording. And if that student needs a badge on a second day, then they have to pay for it. Then it's a book fee and they have to pay for a replacement card. After all, if those ID cards are provided to the student on the picture day, it's actually, the, the, uh, the school is paying for it. It is school property, it has been lost. There is a sense of responsibility that students have to have to carry an ID card. 
When they turn 18 and they're stopped on the street, the police officer will ask them for ID. Does anybody know the consequences if you don't, if you can't produce an ID? They have the right to do anything they want almost. They're going to have a nice conversation with you. Uh, students should not be left out of class. Uh, teachers, you got a plan with teachers even. At 80 teachers plus staff, you got 100 staff members. Do they have ID badges? She stole a little of thunder when she made the statement. Do the teachers wear ID badges? You don't know who's a teacher, who's a parent, who's a volunteer right off the bat with an official district or school badge uh, system. There needs to be a system for replacement, a fast system for replacement. And, and as I said, it just has to be auto replaced after two days. The bottom line is, ID badges require buy-in by the teachers as the first level of enforcement. You can set up systems to make the rest of it work. Thank you. We have no more cards, board members, Director Waterman. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I, appreciate, I appreciate the insight of the teachers. Um, I certainly appreciate the insight of Ms. Lerner in regards to the social dynamic that she could um, imagine. And I, 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 my, the question I pose, which I don't know the, how to answer, is I don't understand what the implication is from the grand jury that our kids aren't wearing uh, ID badges with lanyards. I mean, other than the fact that it's in the handbook, and so then therefore they're breaking the rules or something, it would suggest that our children are strangers and that we need to constantly uh, check them to see if they belong here. And you would think that maybe by the second or third day of class that uh, that we would know who the teachers were and who the students were. Um, and the fact that uh, Ms. Gordon would, would recount a story about actually using that as an opportunity to take away class time from a student is absurd. So at the very least, and what of course we've been digging out of ancient, ar archaic, and um, kind of defunct policies, and we've been cleaning up our policies, I don't doubt that this is an opportunity for us to address district policy and site policy in relation to that, but um, I, I just, I wonder about what the, uh, what the subtext is in, in the statement by the grand jury. Um, and I also just wonder out loud, why would, so if we really truly do, and we should look at it as a design team issue, if we really truly think that keeping ID cards are essential, then why can't we just put them in our wallets instead of look like we're like, um, passing through, I don't know, armed gates or something. Thank you. Director Thompson. I'd like to comment uh, on that. I look at the uh, the ID cards as a sort of a, a human fence for getting back to the fan, uh, perimeter fence. Uh, when students are wearing their ID cards, you know exactly who belongs on campus and who doesn't. If, uh, imagine in a perfect campus where all the students were wearing their ID cards and someone came on campus and didn't, wasn't wearing one, you'd know immediately that that person did not belong on the campus and the campus supervisor could ask that person, may I help you? And people would feel more secure because we don't, all teachers don't know all students on the campus. They're, they're very familiar with their own classes and their own students, but they can't be expected to know everyone. And, and if they saw someone without one, they would know that that person didn't belong there. And if they see the students with it, they would not be so uh, you know, afraid of these kids. Uh, at my son's school, when they uh, went to um, ID cards, it was tough. The same thing happened. People that were wearing them were nerds, and they got picked on. And the other kids that wouldn't work, they were cold, blah, blah, blah. What they did was they went to a, a, a program where in order to get your lunch, you needed to swipe your ID card. Within a month, it was 100% wearing your ID cards. But I, it's, a, it's a good way to uh, control you know, access to the campus. That's my opinion. Any other comments? Director Stewart. Thank you. Speaking uh, very much related to what Director Mumsey just uh, claimed, this is one of the more universal issues, I'm sure, has best practices for how best to handle this issue um, nationwide, worldwide. Um, and so 
I think we'd be better off looking at something along those lines to see what works, what doesn't, and a, a more universal uh, mindset on an issue like this. I, I very much like what you just stated about uh, having something built in that more or less motivates um, to follow the rules. Um, another potential um, uh, solution to this that I discussed with staff had to do with whether <coughs> what percentage of our students are still bringing uh, their phones to school. And I'm guessing most folks would guess it's probably in the 90 percentile. And if you are carrying your phone, your lock screen should be your ID, either a picture of it or whatever the case may be. And that way, if you have your phone, you have your ID. Um, so it's either a backup to the actual um, lanyard or ID or something along those lines. But there has to be some best practices already in place or something like that. One more thought. Uh, the gentleman described it um, as, as, as if this was our plant or giant place of employment. Um, kids should realize that when you go to Kaiser, everybody that's working over there has their ideas for support. So you think of it as, uh, you know, it's, it, it happens in the workplace. It's universal, as uh, uh, Director Stewart said. So there you go. I, I feel that we need to support the, the sense of responsibility among our students. And that carrying a, an ID card is a, a responsible act. And it's something that we all have practices noted by, by uh, Mr. Momsen in regards to to having ID at, at Kaiser or any other place that we go. And so we should support that and, and make sure that, that we are able to enforce it for, for the sake of safety. And so I am supportive of having uh, an identification that is, that is supported by the whole community. Thank you. Director Water, thank you. In all, in all due respect for my colleagues, of course, um, I, 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 hear what you, I hear what we're all saying, and I think that searching out best practices is a great idea. I like the, the, uh, the connection with the career relationship, and, the, and because we're working on that in regards to our students anyways. But if we're going to make keeping food from them part of the punitive measures, you will find a fight with me. Food is not an issue that we, can, we, we should not be uh, considering restricting food, especially in a district like this where there's such uh, documented hunger. Um, personally, um, I think um, being able to identify students is very important, but I certainly like uh, Director Stewart's <coughs> idea that um, the secondary uh, definitely be the cell phone. We, we need to, to be strategically with the, those things that our students can also relate to, to uh, help to assist us and to ensure that um, we have our students in classes. So certainly, uh, student IDs um, uh, with uh, their cell phone. I like that idea. Very much so. Good job, doing to students. <laughs> uh, we have a card from Kathy Hill. Uh, uh, Mr. Munson was the one that did reiterate what I had in my mind. Bring up the fact that I was on I'm on campus. I'm in the pop office, so I have visibility from the Atari gym through the portables and around there. That has been a gateway for people to come on campus without going through the front. And I've had the experience of having to call. Um, our safety, site safety officers to come and intercept groups of young men that have come through that back way and split up where some are drawing the uh, safety officers to where they're at so the other ones can go do their business on the other side of campus. So yes, we do need some kind of identification, not for tracking our kids, 
but making sure those intruders are intercepted. And, and they are for the safe, and it is for the safety of our kids. That's all. Thank you. So many of you that everyone agrees that, uh, you know, we have a policy, it's the enforcement of the policy uh, uh, that certainly uh, the design team, uh, so that it can, how it can best be enforced and the processes uh, should be looking at with all stakeholders. Thank you. Uh, we're moving on to item number seven. Six. six. Trying to rush us along. Rush us along. <laughs> Item number six. Director Mosin. In violation of the Vallejo High School Code of Conduct. Students are not arriving to class on time. Uh, the Treasurer's recommendation, Vallejo High School Administration enforce the policy that all students arrive to class on time. Good evening, everybody. My name is Chuck Shavan. I'm assistant principal in that good community and a uh, proud alumni of Vallejo High School somewhere in the 80s. Uh, specifically addressing bullet number one, through positive behavior interventions and supports, or PBIS, which gives not only rewards but praise for a student being safe, respectful, and responsible on campus or in the class, through a patch reward cards which are given by teachers and staff. Uh, students have received prizes from raffles, candies, ice creams, and pizza rewards during the various school years and functions, including testing and so forth. Um, admin is currently working on an all-call parent notification system that would not only address absences, tardies, etc., but also could notify parents of their students doing well in the areas of being safe, respectful, and responsible, which is part of the PBIS, the positive part. Specifically talking about bullet number two, VHS staff currently monitors students' weekly attendance and has a three-step process of lunch detentions, Saturday schools, and in-house suspensions as a consequence for students that do not get to class on time. We will continue to work to better our systems and services in regards to the student success teams, or SSTs, and the Student Attendance Review Boards, or SARB as they're known, to help these students who don't comply with a series of consequences as previously mentioned. These, of course, being a second and third tier process. Thank you. Uh, Cords, Carla Krauss. That's Corla Krace. Oh, sorry, Corla Krace. I apologize. Quite all right. I've been used to it my whole life. <laughs> uh, my name is Corla Crace. I'm a proud badge wearer of Vallejo High School. Um, um, and I do want to address the attendance thing, but I also want to address a, a medium-sized elephant. Um, I'm white. I can't help that. I do live an hour away from here. Can't help that either. I have dedicated 19 years of my life to the students of this district, and you might ask somebody how many of them call me Auntie Corla, or ask them how many students come to my classroom for lunch because they need a safe place. I get a little tired of being criticized for something I can't help either. Um, but what I would like to say about the attendance is that it is a real problem, and I don't have any solutions but I would also like to point out that it is directly related often to the grades I have to give my students because if they're not there, then there's nothing that I can go to as many seminars on good teaching as I want to go to. I can try everything I can to get them there, but I can't teach them if they're not there. 
I think that some sort of enforcement, I wish I had a good answer because you're not supposed to talk about a problem if you don't have a solution, but um, our positive um, rewards are helping, I think, some, but I do really hate to give the grades I have to give to a student who just doesn't come. Thank you. You've not born yet. things that happen for or that we don't control come about for a good reason and if we take this into a positive thing which I feel like the direction we're going in now I see us Vallejo High becoming a better school from it and the community becoming better from it the only thing that concerns me in light of all of this and looking at the recommendations is I don't see in the recommendations uh, and for uh, solutions that talk about relationships with teachers because we are at the forefront as the minister indicated I'm not saying we have all the answers because oftentimes as I've shared with with our administration here I, I get our kids here on a daily basis that look like they're depressed or they're just dealing with issues that are beyond my control and I still do my best to work with them, but at the end of the day, I believe we need more services. And I think if we look in that light of finding what we need to do to help these young people, because they want hope, as the minister indicated. They're not criminals. I don't view them as criminals. And I want to give them hope every day I walk into the classroom. So I just want to say thank you. And, and uh, also to President Wilson, just to hear you say that we have to work together means a lot. Thank you. You're welcome. Willie Williams, followed by Cookie Gordon, followed by Alexis Rock, followed by um, Raymond Johnson and Maura Billman. Yes, uh, to the uh, one president, Mr. Wilson, two superintendents, and two rest of your board members, you must, you must ask for forgiveness that I did not address you like that when I first got up here because I was so, in such a hurry to get up here and speak my mind. Uh, so now I'm coming to correct myself. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say that, um, you know, when you, the other comment about the IDs, well, when I left, when I retired from Vallejo Unified School District in 2009, all teachers and staff were required to wear IDs. Now, what happened? Why aren't the instructors and staff wearing IDs? So you cannot, you cannot put one rule on, on someone else that you would not find yourself. But that's not, unless that rule has changed. I mean, so, but I do know, when I retired, everybody had to wear IDs, all staff and teachers. Now, what happened since then, I don't know. Maybe, don't do as I do, do as I say do, is going on here. Um, the uh, the uh, first uh, bullet there, you know, one item is, is missing, a, a critical com component. What about contacting the parent? If you have a child that's continually coming to your classroom late, what responsibility is, your, is it on your part to contact the parent and see what the problem is? Inform the parent, your child is coming to school late, my classroom late. You have to accept some responsibility as an instructor in that classroom, not someone else. It's, you are the first line of defense, not the administration. You have to do your part. So that component needs to be included. Now, um, the other thing here is somewhat troubling to me. This investigation was supposed to deal with violence. 
on Bloor High School's campus. So what does it have to do with enforcing a policy of students coming to school on time? I mean, where is the connection between the violence in school and the kids coming to your classroom on time? So I think that the grand jury went outside of the scope of its invest in investigation. Uh, why? Uh, maybe they just must be uh, fishing for stuff to just put in here. Anyway, that's all I have to say right now. I'll be back. Thank you. Thank you. So when I first moved uh, over here uh, to Vallejo, my sons were in this district. My last year, my son uh, had to go to Hogan because we moved to the Hogan district. And then when the schools got closed and things happened, transportation was not considered. So my son was late to school every single morning. And likewise, many other students, because I live over there by Maritime Academy. And for the record, I'm half white and half black and I can't help that either. Now, I don't want to either. Um, and I have to take two buses to come here, $27 taxi to come here. And I have to buy a $47 bus pass for my son so that he can take two buses, that's two hours. You can ask one of our uh, members on the board, he can tell you. And when I was going to school, I had a bus from Old Park to Sacramento High School. And I got to school on time. Many of us adults have cars, so we can get here on time, but yet we're late. I know I used to work in a, in a situation where I had to take your time chart, your clock, and you were late. But we're talking about students who also have siblings who go to school at nine o'clock, and no matter how bad we want it, their education come first, those students need to make sure their siblings get to school safe because their single parent has to get to work at five o'clock in the morning. I've seen it happen in apartments that I live. They're going to school, and then when they get there, there's, they come back home because they were late and they got rejected. So five minutes, I even know a, a child, we had a bus situation where they thought that the school started at 7, uh, 7.45, and we got that at 7.40, and yet it really starts at 74, 7.45 or 7.50, and the teachers were marking the kids absent, I mean, marking them late. So what is late? We need to make sure we establish the true time, legal time, and then make sure that we are not holding kids a penalty when it's supposed to be a five minute grace time, if that makes sense. That's just my thought on that. And this will be the first example. Thank you. And I wore my badge when I came here. Rock and I am a junior here at Vallejo High School. Um, well, Vallejo High School does have a lot of problems, but I only have three minutes to talk, so I can't really get into that. But earlier today, I was reading part of the grand jury report, and I noticed that it said that VHS um, administration claimed to give students a 15-minute grace period in the morning. Well, I don't think that's true because I witnessed that it's more like a 30-minute grace period. And I feel that by allowing students to uh, be late is very disruptive to classrooms, especially in my own first period. I mean, I think it's a real problem when the period starts with six people and ends with 24. Um, and I'm not exaggerating on that. I really took count one day. <laughs> and I feel it doesn't prep students for life, because in life you don't get a grace period, you get fired. <laughs> happens to those who are late. They don't even get a pass to class. They don't, I don't even think they get a call home, to be honest, because nothing happens. It happens every single day for the past 100 and however many days there are so far, but people, some people come late every day out of the 180 days that are in school, and that needs to change. And another side note that I just wanted to add was that it was mentioned that there's a lot of things we can't do for our own safety, such as the uh, radios and on-campus officers. 
you guys said that it was a lot of uh, money and we don't have budgets to do that. Well, I feel that we should be spending money on our safety and on-site officers rather than an incomplete fence that does not serve its full purpose. And that is it. Thank you. Raymond Johnson. And fo followed by Mara Beatley. Hello again, guys. So, I guess I want to start by saying, this is just in my opinion, being on time in a class or anything really is a lot like brushing your teeth. We all know we are supposed to do it. So, there's that. Um, uh, I'd like to say that when I saw, before I even saw this recommendation, I saw in section four on page five, that it said that the grand jury had noted some students did not arrive to class on time. Uh, I'm pretty sure that not all campuses have perfect attendance with all their students. And just this recommendation in general to me seems, I don't want to say unnecessary, but just it's kind of insulting in a way to me just because I feel like it focuses on the negativity out of campus, which is something that does need to be focused on, don't get me wrong. But I think that it focuses more on that than the positivity. It kind of reminds me of what Ben and Mary were saying when they were up here, is that there are some criminals, but then there aren't criminals. And if we focus just on the bad at our school instead of the positivity, then that just portrays this negative image of our school instead of the positive one that we're hoping to achieve through meetings like this. Um, I have cut class. Uh, I'm afraid to say that. And when I have cut class, I try and avoid campus security guards and administration because they tell me to get to class. Whenever I can be out of class with a pass in my hand, the campus security guards will tell me to get to class or ask what I'm doing out of class or who my teacher is. So we can't just put all this blame on our staff because if I'm a member of this administration and I'm telling people to get to class and they know, like brushing your teeth, they're supposed to do it, then I'm sure, I mean, I, what more can I do? Maybe there's something else I can do, but really, you're supposed to brush your teeth in the morning, dude, come on. Um, I will say that there's only one thing that I didn't know about attendance, and that is that if you miss nine days and they're on excuse, you can get an F in a class, and I can't even put that on the administration because it's in our planner. So a lot of it is just knowledge. And we read our planners at the beginning of every year, so or the beginning parts of our planners with the rules. So we can't put all this blame and negativity on our campus and our staff when there's a lot of good and there's a lot of common sense. That's why this is this recommendation is just insulting. You know you're supposed to be a place on time. This, why? I, I just don't see the point in it, and I think it, Spoke from the negativity. That's all I wanted to say. And I don't go around patrolling for badges, but I'm pretty sure a lot, if not all, of our staff wear some form of identification. But that's just me. Thank you. Thank you. teacher at Vallejo High School on the ninth grade side and I really wanted to address this um, because when I was seeing the recommendation and then our response the staff will continue to encourage and then students who need additional assistance will continue to be referred um, so we're planning to continue doing the things that are not effective and I have referred many students for SSTs for serious attendance issues that are out of my scope I've called home, I've done warnings, I've done conferences, I've arranged for students who are missing first period English to switch that with their PE class so that at least they're not missing a class that they need all four years of. And I'm referring them to an empty box because we have not been able to get that ASP position filled. Um, and as far as I know, we don't have a SAR worker. So I have tried to follow our tardy procedure and have hit a brick wall. 
because we do not actually have the ASP, so we can't refer them for SSDs, or we can't, but again, nothing happens. Um, meanwhile, there are certain fairly basic systems that we could do to help our students succeed, because some of the things that we're doing are setting them up for failure. Um, so for example, I have a student who has 75 tardies to my third period class, no tardies to any other class, because he needs to get food during the nutrition break and we give them three minutes to do that. And he cannot get through the line at the snack bar and back to my class in time, much less eat that, in three minutes. Um, so we're telling him, basically, that we will not allow you to be successful. We're, we're telling you, you can go get a snack, but you're not gonna make it on time. Um, we also had an issue at the ninth grade side where for several months we did not have working bells. Um, and our students, did not come on time because they, you know, again, in an ideal world, they'd have watches, they'd have phones, they'd keep track of it on their own. But if we tell students to expect bells and then we take away bells and we don't fix that in a timely manner, we are again preparing them to fail. Um, and that's just not fair to them. Thank you. Elijah. Aaliyah Wine White. Hi, my name is Aaliyah White, and if you look at my um, my attendance, you'll notice that sometimes I'm late to first period because my house is kind of far away. So it's kind of natural that I'm going to be late, but I mean, not now because I feel like I would get really know to get here but I think that it's not as important as us being late to like first period or second period or something but it's just, we should worry about people who ditch class or just skip class because I mean there's some things that we can't control we miss the bus um, the bus is run late or your parents can't take you or something you know, I have siblings so I have to wait for the shower and then we all have to go at the same time so I mean you have to wait on certain things so I don't think we should worry about people being tardy we should worry about people who ditch and skip school instead of you know this. I mean, like I said, there's some things that we can't control. We should focus on other things. That's what I want to say. Thank you. <laughs> that was the last card. Board member comment. Director Waterman. Again, I'd really like to show my appreciation for the comments of the students. I think it's probably the most insightful part of our meeting. And I, I want to um, give you props for being a real part of this process. I'm impressed, you know, and I'm just so grateful to have you guys in the district. Um, I want to make some, some comments. Um, I know that we have, we have health services in our district. Uh, I heard um, a teacher suggest that there are multitudes of reasons why we have kids who are unable to get up to class on time. I think we need to start drilling down on that. And if there's anything that our current social services in our schools can do to facilitate their, um, their success, then we should be, you know, maybe refining our process to get, to get our kids into school. I, um, I, what I would really like to ask since we heard from so many students, do you have any recommendations that we haven't been applying so far? And um, I also want to give you props that when I hear the kids talk, I don't hear them say the principal or the teachers or them or you guys. I hear them say our staff, right? There's this deep sense of community that is being expressed just in the language of our kids, and, uh, and I'm very grateful and impressed for that, too. So with that, seven things that haven't been brought up in regards to getting our kids to class on time. And, uh, and lastly, well, actually, two things. I'd like some insight into the ASP position, please. And I'd like to really have a serious conversation in this district, tonight's probably not the night, about the time that we allot for our children to eat. Because it is a constant, I hear it constantly. 
lunch time is too short. Kids aren't eating their lunches. I know this is the third rail, and I've already brought this up, but um, is there some reason why we can't have an honest conversation about having our high school students come to school later in the morning? These are, honestly, these are, I'm posing these questions so that we can have larger discussions about them in the future. Um, but I think that these are all real, real issues. I've heard stories about older siblings having to get their, their siblings off to school and they don't have any time to eat breakfast in the morning so they race off to high school, they don't have time for snack, they don't have time for, the lunch line is enormous. We've got children who are functionally not eating at school. So um, I, I really do think that the time for eating is a real issue, and perhaps the hours that we ask our children to be at school might be an issue too. Thank you. Um, in the grand jury report, is Vallejo informed the grand jury there is a 15-minute grace period after the bell rings during which students may arrive to class. As I understand it, based upon a prior audit finding, that that's the period of time for attendance counting and during the period of time that attendance is to be taken. It is not a grace period for students to arrive to class late. I could, to make sure that I was correct, I spoke to the state auditor yesterday concerning this particular statement. And they further confirmed. Um, in the past, the history on this is, we received a finding, an audit finding, is that not right, Ms. Uh, Cheney? And it was about $6.9 million based upon attendance, the proper accounting of attendance. When, so therefore, procedures have been set up to allow teachers a sp specific period of time to take attendance. And it matters whether a child is marked tardy, absent, or late. That is what the 15 minutes refers to. As I said, I, I didn't take staff, I listened to staff, but I also talked to the state auditor to get correct information. Um, so I'm sure the grand jury misunderstood what staff said, and because it directly quotes Vallejo High School staff said this. So I'm sure they must have misunderstood that. Um, but there is no grace period for getting back time to school, to class. Because a, a grace period is not being, uh, that's free time. So you wouldn't be marked tardy, you wouldn't be marked absent, or you wouldn't be marked late. And all those things take place during that 15 minute or half hour. So there is no grace period. Any other comments? Thank you. Yes, please address the ASB situation. Thank you. Um, first and foremost, I just want to say that the SST process is a state-mandated process. It's not something we can do if we have an ASP or something we can do if we have a counselor to do it. It's state-mandated. And so I would be looking to work with um, the administration to understand uh, what we need to do to support making sure that SSTs and SARBs are occurring. Um, the ASP process. Um, the ASP position, uh, we hired somebody who was dynamite, hit the ground running, and then she moved to Los Angeles. And because we're very selective, we are still in the process of looking for somebody to then fill that open position. And the ASP is the point person for a full service community schools model that Vallejo High is going to in a more robust way on next year. So the ASP um, will be on board when school starts next year, but I do really want to underscore that the SST and the SAR process is mandatory whether we have the presence of a position or not. Thank you. And I really would like to thank not only the students, but the teachers and staff 
as you give us input. This gives us a better uh, understanding of the report, and it also gives us a better way to frame our response to the report. So no one, uh, everyone is giving us very valuable input. The input is welcome. Uh, as I said before, we're doing, we can't do this in a vacuum. We're doing it as a family. And it's very important that uh, everyone has input in, within the design teams. And I strongly encourage that uh, there's a safety or school climate dis uh, uh, design team uh, that works with all of these issues so that we can try and come up with processes, procedures, and um, uh, answers to the things that we have concerns about. And safety is a great concern. So moving on, uh, we're at number seven, Director Stewart. Vallejo High School administration is not informing teachers of a student's prior criminal or disruptive conduct at the time a student is enrolled in their class. The grand jury recommendation is pursuant to California Ed Code 49079, Vallejo High School administration informed teachers at the time a student is enrolled in their class of a student's prior criminal or disruptive conduct. We have yellow cards, Michael Pendergast, followed by Sarah Amojala, Willie Mims, Cookie Gordon, and Tracy McCarthy. Hi, good evening. Uh, as everyone heard, my name is Mike Pendergast. I'm a graduate of Vallejo High School, class of 92. I'm also an ex-con uh, convicted felon, so this kind of hits home. Um, up until I just told you that, most of the people in this room have no knowledge of that. There's a lot of locals that do, but some of you don't. My point being, I don't think you should know, particularly with juveniles. I think juvenile laws are in place, and they'll progressively deal with those things. You give that kid a fair chance. If you don't believe in a second chance, then your glass house is damn fragile. And all I'd ask is that you give that person a chance. If they, if they don't act right, just like you gave me a chance before I addressed you and told you about my past, I haven't done anything yet to prove that my second chance isn't worthy. I don't plan on screwing up again and doing the things that I know I shouldn't have done in the first place. Give these kids a fair chance. This wasn't a pipeline to prison for me. I chose to do a crime outside of campus. I love this school. If I'd have stayed and done the things that I was raised to do here, I would like to believe I'd have a lot more opportunities than I currently have because of that scarlet letter of being an ex-con. So give these kids a fair chance. You know. Uh, as far as their conduct in school, things like that, their record and their behavior with school, that file, certainly teachers should have a right to that. But any criminal crime uh, conduct, it's none of your business until they prove otherwise. Thank you. Actually, I, I, I can't really follow that. I think he said it perfectly. Um, so I just kind of want to um, just say generally a little bit about myself and then I kind of have a general comment with this recommendation in mind. Um, so I'm a former teacher um, from New Orleans and um, I started teaching you know, right after the storm and there are a lot of problems in New Orleans and so I moved into the education um, uh, law of realm because um, I think I, I want to make, you know, wanted to make bigger changes, right? And so through this work at, um, you know, public council where I'm an education lawyer, I've gotten to meet um, 
Dr. Shackelford and Dr. Dermot and me and um, Superintendent Ramona, um, Ramona Bishop, <laughs> um, and um, see all of the really great work that all of you are doing. And I have to say that all of this work is, um, uh, it's everyone's work, so it's not just the leadership and it's not just the board, it's you know, it's all of the teachers, it's all of the parents, it's all of the students. And so I'm really excited that all of you are here today. And so um, I think what I want to say generally is that this is very hard work and I think that you know, your um, approach of taking you know, positive behavior intervention and support into the schools and you know, having this proactive approach is a very um, cost-effective way of um, improving you know, student attendance, improving achievement, improving the safety of your campus. Um, the campus here and then obviously throughout Vallejo City Unified and so um, specifically I'm talking about this um, recommendation because I think this is not the kind of proactive um, the proactive approach that um, you want to take in the school district I think that um, you know I remember when I had a student who uh, whose uh, criminal record I saw instead of um, Instead of uh, uh, teaching him, I became scared of him, and I judged him off the bat instead of thinking about how he later proved himself to be a very smart and creative student who is now in college and just finished his second year. So I think just like the gentleman before me said, and I'm wrapping up here really quickly, um, I think that you know this is, this is kind of a misstep and proactive measures that you're taking now kind of vitiate the need for this and also the need for you know more police on campus. I think there, there are other ways of, of getting at it and you've started that, that great work. Thank you. Sarah. Oh, I'm sorry. She just was late. Um, Willie Mims. To the board again. Compliment you on allowing us to speak on every one of these bullet points. I appreciate that. I have a speaker card coming. Um, you know, first of all, let me say this. Coming from the position of a former teacher, educator, and I'm speaking from experience, every student who ever walked in my classroom, they came in with a clean record. I did not want to know anything about that child at all. That is the only way that you can give a child a fair chance. Why do you want to know what the child's record is unless you want to create a problem for yourself and the child? Why do you need to know this until the child has done something that caused the problem? Why don't you wait until they cause a problem and then ask for the record? You don't need to have this have all this information on the child and unless you have some problems yourself, unless you have some problems with students who walk in your classroom who you don't understand, who walk in your classroom with a culture that you refuse to accept, who walk into your classroom bobbing their heads and, and walking back and forth, who walk in your classroom and intimidate you. You don't need this information. I'm coming from experience of a retired teacher. So you need to treat everybody who comes into your classroom as though they are not a criminal. You cannot assume that whoever comes in your classroom, that they don't look right, that they have some, that they have just left the uh, juvenile facility. That is the problem that I foresee here. You need to be fair to every child who walks through your doors. You need to have respect for every child who walk through your doors, regardless of who they look like, what they look like. Now, getting back over here with this, um, no, informing the teachers. In 2010, 2011 school year, you had over 25,000 referrals out of the classroom. And out of the 25,000, you have almost 18,000 for those of black students. And so, why do you need to know this? 
So if you have all this information, then you're going to create a bias that's already in place based upon the data that's already been put out there by you. 25,000 referrals. That means that a, a, a class of students were not being received, were not receiving any kind of education. That means that the Office of Civil Rights received their complaint in 2010, 2011 school year. That is the problem that I foresee. You don't need to know this because once you, once you see somebody who may not look right, then you will call down to the principal, I want to know what this student what this student's record is. That is the problem that you cause. I mean, I'm not saying that, that teachers don't have a right, because they do have a right to this information, but I'm saying that you should be fair and impartial to all, all of these youngsters who come into your classroom and treat them as though they are human beings and not criminals. So I come each time with personal experience. Um, I somewhat can understand the concern, you know, um, of wanting to know who's coming to your class. But that's when you have to trust your administration, your board, your st the district to know they're doing their job. That's when your job is to trust. Um, however, I had a concern about something that happened with the staff here. A lot of parents were telling me about it and I was disturbed about it. So I tried to call and do my homework on it. I was told that was not my place. I could not know about that adult staff and what they were accused of with a child. And I then had to make a decision, will I trust who I'm looking at? And I chose to trust and believe that they'll take care of that. A lot of our students I have seen look like they were falling down to the wayside, but because your new program, this kid that was in less than one point is now on a roll, not once but twice, because of that second chance. I know that it's scary being in a position where you have to take people at first value, and I, I applaud teachers in, in, in doing that. And I love what I, the teachers I just heard, I can tell they truly care and I can take their criticism. But I'm asking you to understand that I used to work at a group home and I look at the student, I, I'm, I'm proud of him, you know, but when I read his chart, oh my gosh, my thought of him changed. And the same thing happened to my son Charles. He was judged negative for something he did when he was a little kid, like in elementary. And it came up every single time and he said that. And they got judged negatively and it was down here after that. So the kids tend to give up on themselves when they see that adult that's supposed to be there to help them show a fear. So then you know what they're gonna do? They're gonna feed you that fear. So I'm asking us to be very cautious and I have to say the need to know basis is important. Although I wanna know what happened when I wrote, I wrote up four or five people, I didn't get my response yet. I just gotta trust the system. I'll know when I see the difference. So give your kids a chance, please. And don't think the negative first, if you'll take my suggestion on that. Being a mom who loves my son, I have to love him no matter what. But then again, there's moms out there that don't. I just choose to. Tracy McCarthy. Uh, good evening. Um, I've been to a lot of trouble to make this prepared speech, but I'm very moved by the speakers before me, so I'm going to race through this really quick because I do have some good news to share and also some concerns or questions, so I want to get that on the record, and then I would like to speak on a personal level as well. Uh, my name is Tracy McCarthy. I'm a teacher here at Vallejo High. I'm addressing the grand jury report recommendation number seven related to the need for a process for notifying teachers at the time of enrollment of any student with prior criminal or disruptive behavior. See, I told you real fast. BEA members have expressed many occasions when such notification did not occur, and the plan that VHS administration refers to is not implemented. As per our contract in California Ed Code, we filed two grievances that went to level three, so I attended the grievance panels at the district office two times. The VC uh, USD Human Resources Director has conceded this violation, but nothing changed. This has led to significant distrust and frustration. 
Yesterday, I again went to the district office for a grievance panel to discuss the same issue. This time, Dr. Dermody was there and offered to facilitate a meeting between VHS admin, VEA members, so we can develop a plan that will support the teacher's efforts in meeting the needs of all our students, but also protects the privacy rights of individuals and is practical to implement. I was delighted, okay? Um, but I do remain with four concerns. So that's the progress part. It was awesome and exciting to be given that opportunity and I'm looking forward to that very much. The concerns are these four. Um, number one, let's set a specific date for that discussion, ASAP, uh, before school is out this year. We need to get on this. Uh, number two, that we need an agreement about who should be involved in the development of the plan so everybody feels comfortable that people are represented. We also need to include a notification plan for students currently enrolled. The Ed Code, as you can see, addresses when they're being enrolled at that moment. Well, what if they're already one of your students, something happens, they're gone for a while, come back, that kind of thing. Um, so we need to know about that. And number four, the outcome of these discussions be reviewed by a larger group and then implemented so that it's not just us meeting at that moment who decide on something. So uh, teachers care very much about every one of our students. We need all information available about our students in order to design strategies that ensure maximum efficiency for teaching and learning for all students in our charge. An opportunity once again exists for the district to demonstrate sincerity and integrity by following through on their offer to work with us to develop and implement a plan that will support our efforts. So we are excited and looking forward to this. So one more time, when will the meeting happen? Who's going to participate? How can we also include a process to deal with the current kids we have? And what is the proposed date for implementation of the new plan? Thank you for that part. <laughs> Okay. Can I have two minutes to do a personal thing? Yes. Thank you. Okay. This is hard. Um, I was very touched by what Mr. Pendergrast had to say and, and all of the other speakers. And two sides of this affect me very personally. Three sides. First of all, I've had five colleagues this year that were physically attacked by students seriously enough to require medical attention. Wow. Seven. Wow. Okay, so I have a serious concern about the safety of our teachers. That's just, that's what I need to say about that. Secondly, um, I was a pre-medical biology major and I was taught very early on that in order to address how to fix a problem, you had to have an appropriate diagnosis. And the very first, most important step in a diagnosis is to know the history. That if you don't know the history, you don't know what created the problem, it's real hard to work on a solution that's gonna work. So I would ask that you realize that when we're asking for information, it's in that sense that the doctor is asking you, have you traveled out of the country, how many sex partners have you had, et cetera. You know, it might bother you, you might not want to tell, but the reality is they have a reason for asking questions that you might not like to answer, but they're critical to solving the problem. So I just would ask people when you want to know, why do we want to know, that's one of the reasons right there. Um, on a personal note, I have someone very dear to me that um, has had lots and lots of emotional problems over the years. Um, he <laughs> did 26 days in a juvenile facility in eighth grade. And when that happened, it was devastating to our family. And the very first people I went to for support were his teachers. I went to them because I know that they love this person as much as the rest of us. They spend as much time with him sometimes or more than what we can at home. So why would I not want them to know about his difficulty and, and get their support in his recovery? That this is a post-traumatic stress syndrome situation for a lot of kids. They need our support and our love and a plan for how to kind of get reintegrated back into their routines. Don't cripple us from offering assistance to these kids. They need us and our expertise. Thank you.
Samuel Mary and Deborah Sears. Sears. Samuel Murray, and one of the things I wanted to talk about in conduct, and, and I'm glad that the young lady mentioned post-traumatic stress. One of the things in post-traumatic stress, going back to Egypt, is that our folks who had been captured and had to get here had a problem that they had to deal with, and they had expertise that they had to learn how to come up with. I don't necessarily think that teachers can be doctors. And understanding the problem, how to be a doctor, and how to properly solve the problem. The other thing that I recognize is being an African American male who is have, uh, slightly big, have a bald head, and I've walked in and I'm in communications for a living. I've gotten into an elevator and made people uncomfortable and watch women uh, of other colors grab their purse thinking that I was going to rob them. So I understand that process of judging even though we shouldn't judge. So the reality is, is I think if this person has a problem, the people who really have the skills should fix their problem and that should be done by the intake process. The intake process should show a student we should know what a student has been through and be able to put that student in the type of environment which is able to make them to succeed. I think a lot of times we tend to think that we can do things that we really don't have the skills to do. For instance, I don't have the skills to be a superintendent. I have the skills to be a communicator, but I can't do the superintendent's job. I think it is important that we understand to learn how to let, let people who have the proper training and background, and I would hope, the, in closing, I also want to say this. We as parents and as community see problems that exist, and we have to ask the question, are we willing to pay to solve the problem? As parents, as residents, are we willing to pay add a little more taxes to pay for our children to get the success that they really need? Are we really willing to allow people to have the opportunity when we look around the world that we're competing against today that our children aren't in school as long as other countries to be educated? Are we really creating the kind of environment to make them a winner? That's where conduct all comes in. And so if you expect to have this time to do these certain things, we have to create an environment that one creates an environment for them to be able to learn how to properly express themselves and they won't have a conduct problem. I want to thank you guys for allowing me the opportunity to say what I have to say. Thank you. Yeah, you see. Hi, I'm Deborah Sears, a parent here in the district. You heard me speak earlier. Um, since I brought up discipline info and information in my first comments, I wanted to speak about this. I agree with a lot of what's been said. I think teachers do need information to diagnose issues as much as parents need information about the adults to diagnose and decide whether I've put my children in the right place. When I hunt for a preschool, I can go to the state and I see all complaints and whether staff were involved in that complaint and whether it was substantiated so I can put my baby in a safe place. That goes away with public schools. I can go to the California Commission on Teacher Credentialing and I have to hunt my last name across the entire state to find out if Miss So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so has a flag on their record. So I have to trust our credentials process here in our schools. That's difficult. Why can't it be on the SARC? I know about highly qualified, whatever that means, but why can't I know how many formal complaints have been put on this district and how many were substantiated? Why can't I know how many teachers were hired with flags and given a second chance? I don't need names. I just want to know, overall, how safe are the adults around my children? When you can tell me that, then this ed code will mean something to me. Thank you.
recommendation um, finding eight. If you don't mind. I'm sorry. That's why. Um, that's that's a, this is a delicate topic, and um, and I just asked uh, Trustee Mumson to actually boot up his computer so I could actually read the exact language of this particular ed code. Um, first of all, it should be noted that this ed code is about 20 years old. It is still ed code, and. Um, I see and I respect the, the insight of all of our speakers. And Mr. Pendergast, thank you very much for your honesty. You are exactly the kind of man that we want working in this district. Um, it seems that we have very little choice but to implement California Ed Code. And it strikes me that what we're trying to do with some of our interventions and training is learn how to address the biases that we're concerned about being uh, somehow affirmed by the California Ed Code. So what we need to do, do is better address the biases that we're anxious about, but I am unclear as to the wisdom or even our ability to do any skirting of California Ed Code. I think it needs to be implemented with uh, compassion and delicacy, in my opinion. But until we start petitioning for a, uh, a more refined, maybe more current uh, ed code with uh, more sophisticated language, then I, I don't see how we have the option. Thank you. Thank you for letting me address um, everyone again. Um, and thank you, Ms. McCarthy, you made it so much easier for me to read this bullet, that we will be working with the VEA to collaboratively enhance our process and Trustee Waterman, thank you for your comment as well, because this particular Ed Code is actually talking about three specific types of offenses, not just any and every disruptive type of behavior, but three specific types, and understanding that it's 20 years old, kind of. 20 years ago, when you said a child made a terroristic threat, that meant something different than today. Um, to say that a child, um, is the, the different sexual harassment, those type of things. Uh, are the three different things that are mentioned here. We do have a meeting scheduled, so Ms. McCarthy, if you check your email, <laughs> it's for June 7th, it is before the end of the school year. We are bringing in uh, legal counsel to help us around, because this is tied to recommendation eight, around FERPA, because at the tail end of that, if you, if you got down that far, it really talks about why. And the why the teachers are supposed to be notified is for help in the students. And so I'm really, I'm really looking forward to hearing from our teachers union how we are going to help the students when we have this information. And I also am looking forward to hearing about um, the list of students that, that I, from what I understand exist of people who are on, or students of ours who are on probation that they weren't notified of. Because in some ways, even that list being in existence and the conversation being had between teachers about those students is a violation of FERPA in, in and of itself, which is kind of tied to the eight of them. Thank you. Recommend any further comments by the board? Yeah. Director Monson. Yeah, just, a, just a point of fact, um, currently there's a committee being assembled to address ancient Ed code, it's something that's just been added to and added to over the years. And there's been very little reform in actually rewriting the code. And this is one of the codes that happens to be uh, taking a really, really close look at. Uh, language in here speaks um, on a must improve, uh, who is reasonably, sus or re has engaged in this activity, or is reasonably suspected of having engaged in this activity. That leaves the door open for a, 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 a witch hunt and gossip here, so yeah. there's some dangerous language in here. It was recently modified in February, they added a paragraph in February of this, of this year, um, which it has to do with um, privacy. And otherwise, it's most of it is way over 20 years old. Uh, the last um, amendment was in uh, 1994. Uh, 
about punitive <coughs> processes for someone who fails to, uh, or, falsify, or falsely inform somebody of some kid's action. But this is one of the codes that's uh, being looked at to be rewritten, and like I said, a community is being assembled to, to overhaul the Ed Code, which is going to be a very arduous journey. So, uh, Trustee Mumson, if there were interested parties in the room who wanted to chime in on their opinion about this Ed Code, who would they contact? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, California School Boards Association is uh, uh, very much involved. We'd be on the CSBA Legislative Action website. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Really briefly, um, really briefly, with regard to the Positive Youth Justice Initiative work, where we have a collaborative effort with county agencies and so forth that was mentioned before, um, we had a $75,000 planning grant, again, probation sits at the table. One of the things that we've talked about is having a robust, much more robust SST process, where if a student is currently on probation, then probation would actually come to the table and offer resources at the table um, that would allow for some collaboration to help us address the needs of our students that need us the most. And in addition, um, one of the things that we, have, we are focused on learning about and we'll be providing workshops um, for when we get the next level of funding, which will be $400,000 for next year. It would be um, trauma-informed care, really educating our entire community about trauma-informed care, and also really educating all of our community about the positive um, asset-based approaches that David Muhammad mentioned earlier. So just wanted to let you know that grant was written over a year ago to address this very specific concern from us and we fully expect it will be fully funded on next year for the 400000 Thank you. Any other comment? We're at uh, finding number eight. Director Momsen. Finding number eight. The Lamb City Unified School District Teachers, access, teachers' access to the student disciplinary portion of the ARIES system has been blocked by the district administration. The uh, grand jury's recommendation is Vallejo City Unified School District reinstate teachers' access to the ARIES student disciplinary portion of the system. discussing with the teachers union and state law. Confidential pupil records are only accessible on a need-to-know basis. Teachers have immediate access to appropriate discipline information. When we really were talking about timely information as well, and there is a process for requesting additional information should they need or choose or have a suspicion that they want to investigate. Any other comments for staff? <coughs> Okay, um, cords, Judith, Judith, Judith Lerner, Sheila, Gwen Gradwell, and Willie Mims. Hi there, everybody again. Um, I, I, um, we used to have access to the Aries uh, discipline records, and um, I, I've been listening. It's this um, recommendation is very closely related to the previous one. Um, when I hear um, Dr. Bishop talking about all these great new services that we will have for our students, I am hopeful and think maybe I don't need to know all this information. The problem is, or the issue is, or my, 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 I'm having difficulty trusting that I don't need to know because for a very long time, although I am not qualified to provide the services that the kids need who have these kinds of issues, I'm the only thing there is, okay? I'm a teacher in a classroom 
and I've had situations where kids come in and just complete tears because some cousin has been shot and I've got nobody in the office who is able to deal with that and what am I going to do, teach about verbs? No, we stop everything and I let their buddy talk to them. That's all I've got. So sometimes um, I would love to be able to say if somebody else needs to handle this. But if I'm the one who has to handle it, then I need all the information I can get. And unfortunately, that's been the situation. If we really are going to have things like trauma-informed care and you know grants coming in and you know other people are going to help me with it, great, because I'm not qualified. And I don't need that information to teach math. But if I'm going to do all the other stuff, I do need that information. So thank you very much. Thank you. She was very well followed, uh, followed by Willie Williams. <coughs> Good evening, members of the board. Um, I am Sheila Gradwell. I am the bargaining chair of BEA. So I'm speaking in that capacity. Over the last several bargaining sessions, this has been a big issue that's come up, and we thought we had worked it out last time. Our teachers, they don't want the access to judge. They want it so that they can understand and help our students, just like the previous speaker said. The information is important to us. And, and on top of that, um, every year we survey our members to say, you know, what is important to you? And, and teacher safety is one of the big issues. And because of that, we need to have our members have access to what is going on in their classrooms so they can protect themselves, protect their students, and understand what's going on. So um, I'm hoping for these conversations. I'm hoping, I wasn't sure if I should speak under Recommendation 7 or Recommendation 8 because they are so <coughs> intertwined. But we do need to make sure that we are following state law, ed code, and making sure that we protect our students and our teachers. And just for the record, I am one of those teachers who lives in the community. I've lived here for almost 30 years. My, my own kids went to Vallejo schools. I'm a part of this community. So what happens here deeply affects me. Just want to get that out. Thank you. anywhere at all. That if, that if that was the case, then you would not have all of those referrals, all of those suspensions, all of, uh, all of those uh, 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 disciplinary actions of particular subjects. So don't tell me about anything about fair. So I would implore you to abide by the law and limit the amount of information that the teachers have on students. Uh, principals all know that they have instructors who will knowingly set up students. They know that, but they will not uh, stand up here and say it, but they know that they have come across many students who have been set up by instructors because they knew some information about them. And uh, uh, students, you know, they think they're smart. 
uh, majority, but they're not. They have no idea that once an instructor has it in for you, uh, that's it. They'll do, they'll do the smallest thing possible, and you won't have any idea that you've been set up. And so the referral comes in probably the suspension later. So I just, I was just would implore you uh, not to give too much accessibility to the teachers. Shayla Okay, um, I've been a teacher in this district. This is my eighth year, and honestly, I really haven't even looked at the discipline when I had it available to me because, as far as I'm concerned, the student coming in has a clean slate, so it really doesn't bother me either way. But there has been communication through our school email that if you want access to the student records, we do have a binder. If you want to go to the to the um, admin office and actually look at it if you're concerned about a certain student. It's not there for you to sit there and look through everybody's records, but it is there if you have a valid concern. So it is available to an extent if you're willing to make the effort to go look at it. So it might not be readily available on Aries, but it is available. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Director Waterman, thank you. Um, I need some clarification. Are we looking at, is the request that all teachers have access to information about all students? Their own students. Their own students. Um, I recognize that, okay, so I have children in the district, and I know that my, um, my son who has struggled to read has been very well served by his first grade teacher and that the second grade teacher had a conversation with the first grade teacher and that teacher was prepared to uh, support my son um, in regards to his particular challenges and um, issues. And I don't doubt that that is a common practice for anyone who cares about our kids, that we're all ushering them along and we're supporting them and that in the, in the, best, in the best of ways the information that you would need about your student is probably very available to you. Um, if you have a very strong concern, and it isn't something that your colleagues can help you understand, um, it strikes me that the administration can. So I, I, um, I'm reticent to give up, in fact, I'm very reticent to, to give up uh, and tread on the, the privacy of our children who are in our charge um, to, to help get access to things that are already, should be already pretty functionally available. I don't understand the, I certainly understand Ms. Lerner's concern and I recognize that she's an excellent teacher and that she'll, she pinch hits and she gets in there and she supports her kids for sure. Um, clearly what we need to do is make sure that our system has enough, of our community school system has enough support so that our teachers can actually trust the fact that we've got, we've got a safety net underneath these children. But I'm not convinced that opening up the Pandora's box of the privacy issue is the way to go about that. over and over and over 
it on the phones calling because they just don't want to handle the issues in their problem and they just want to get those kids out of their class. Um, it's the same teachers over and over. Now, is VEA going to be um, amiable to opening up the teachers' records when it comes to their reporting and their referral records? Because that will kind of open eyes to the community as to who are the ones complaining about the minority students in their class. So it goes both ways. If you're going to do it with the students, I want to see it done with the teachers. I have no more cards on number eight. Uh, <clears throat> we have several more to go. Um, what I would suggest is item findings 10, 11, and 12 all deal with website issues. So we will combine those and take them jointly. Um, we'll do nine separately. And I think that's all I can combine. But the evening is moving along and we are trying to not to skirt anything or we, but we also want to address everything. But uh, just to also save time because I do have a recommendation for a follow-up meeting. Um, uh, finding nine, Director Yvonne. The positive behavior interventions and support program may be an effective program to assist the teachers in controlling disruptive behavior on campus. The program is not being implemented effectively. Teachers at Vallejo High School informed the grand jury that this program has been unsuccessful because Vallejo High School administration is not holding the students accountable for their inappropriate behavior. Recommendation 9A, Vallejo City Unified School District and Vallejo High School administration provide a comprehensive explanation of the positive behavior intervention and support program. Recommendation 9B, Vallejo City Unified School District and Vallejo High School administration adhere to written policies regarding discipline. I'd like to begin by addressing the part of 9A um, from a district standpoint. In December of 2011, the district began implementing the positive behavior intervention support strategies and program, otherwise known as PBIS. Since that time, the Vallejo High School team, as well as the teams from all of our other schools, have attended um, six days of training with multidisciplinary teams that included admin, students, classified staff, teachers, and um, parent leaders. And with that, I'll turn it over to um, Mr. Morris. Dr. Morris. Thank you. Good evening. The so in addition to this being the first year full implementation at Vallejo High School, uh, the ongoing training that was described earlier is going to continue. Uh, with regards to 9B, uh, Vallejo, High School, Vallejo City School District and Vallejo High School adhere to policies regarding discipline. Um, again, another one of those recommendations that's a little vague, it's unclear as to which particular policies are being referred to. But what we can say is that um, the parent teacher student handbook is, which outlines the disciplinary process of referrals, is continuing to be updated. The design team will continue, will review the handbook, and staff will again uh, clarify the processes so that administration, teachers, students, parents, and the entire community is well aware of the processes in um, with regards to student discipline. Good evening, I'm Tamara Matson, Instructional Reform Coordinator, and um, as you can see by the PowerPoint um, at the Vallejo High Staff meeting on May 15th, we had a response form, and um, we had 53 total respondents fill out this survey. As you can see, when you look at the numbers, they don't add up to 53 in each category because some of the staff members either didn't answer 
or they answered twice in each category. Good evening, I'm Ellie Aguilar, Vice Principal. I'm just going to briefly go over the results from the survey that was conducted. So 41 of our respondents um, indicated that they attended the site-specific PBIS one-day training at the school. 11 indicated that they did not attend the, the training. In terms of actual PBIS implementation, 11 also indicated that they did not understand PBIS and uh, indicated the need for more training. 29 expressed an understanding of PBIS and indicated that they implemented the lessons referring to the matrices during their daily instruction. 10 noted that they understood PBIS and have seen evidence of the school-wide positive behavior system. Four um, indicated other and two responded that they did not see evidence of PBIS. In terms of the restorative justice, uh, 50 of the respondents noted that they attended the staff development sessions and that they understood the basic elements. Seven indicated that they did not attend the staff development session um, and did not understand the basic elements. So although the recommendation from the grand jury was stating that our staff did not have um, understanding of PBIS, you can see by staff members on May 15 responded that they attended the site PBIS training at the beginning of the knowledge of the PBIS system. Uh, Tari Ramoff followed by Ivana Hazard Sheila Bradwell, Wall, Bruce Wilson. Yes. I don't have it, but I'll. Um, so I don't have it, but I'll. So when I came here today was because a teacher, she like. She came and informed me that they would have a, a meeting about this kind of stuff. So, like, she put her faith in me to come here because I guess she felt that I can have a lot to say. But, <clears throat> like, the real question is, what is PBIS? Like, what if it doesn't work? I mean, the money that you put into each and every teacher could be used to buy better things like better lunches or um, more security. Like, the boys' bathroom doesn't even have water, so <laughs> that makes me feel negative. <laughs> yeah, um, you have to treat the students as children. Most of us are not grown yet. I'm only 17. I know that it's a professional thing for most teachers, but you hold the future in your hands to make a difference in each and every children. And you have like the chance to make us the people we, we will be. And yeah, that's it. Tyree. And I would be willing to meet with you, Tyree, uh, on, a one, on a personal uh, basis. And uh, I hope we hold the conversation very soon. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Ayana, Ayana Hazard, and I'm a junior at Vallejo High School. And what I have to say doesn't really apply to the whole PBIS situation. What applies is like the criticism that our teachers are getting. They, I've heard numerous complaints about how the teachers aren't doing their jobs. And in fact, like I've heard, like they don't care, they don't enforce the rules. But in fact, I would say like they, they're the only ones that enforce the rules. And it shouldn't, it shouldn't matter where the teacher lives in the district or not. What matters is that they drive long distances just to come here, which, prove, which, which is a prime example of why, how they care. And just to like wrap it up, I just want to say 
that the staff and the teachers, they're doing their part and it's time for us the students as well as the parents to do theirs as well. Again, my name is Leona Hazard. Thank you. Um, Sheila Redwell, Sheila, then Bruce, Deborah, and Willie. Um, I just want to say I really support the PBIS system. I, view, I used it several years ago at Wiedemann, then it was taken away from us, and then it was brought back district-wide. And I think it's great that we have expectations for everyone. The problem I see is not that the teachers aren't implementing it. I think that the survey also didn't say that the teachers weren't implementing it. And from the grand jury report, it was that they were feeling that the administration was not holding the students accountable for their inappropriate behavior. So what I've heard is, and I've seen it myself, the teachers take care of it, but it doesn't reach all students. What happens when it doesn't reach all students? We don't have the resources available to handle those students that are the top tier students. And that's where the system seems to fall down. And those students, because we don't want to have that pipeline to prison, and we also don't want to have a suspension, right? we put them back in the classroom. And then that's where there's more problems. That's where the teachers aren't able to control the class because the top tier students aren't being given the resources they need so that their problems can be dealt with in the appropriate manner. As been said before, we don't have the proper training to deal with all situations. So while PBIS is a positive step, and I really applaud the district for this, and I love it in my classroom, we need to make sure that it's being implemented from the teachers all the way up through the administration so that when there is a child in your class that you cannot handle, there are steps appropriately taken to get the intervention for those, two, those students. Thank you. Thank you. Deborah Sears, followed by Willie Mims. Oh, Bruce, Deborah, and then Willie Mims. Okay. Good evening, members of the board. It's good to see you. Um, Director Wilson, uh, Superintendent uh, Bishop, and brothers and sisters out there too. <laughs> Uh, my name is Bruce Wilson. I've been teaching the district for 24 years, so I have a, a perspective that uh, many of the board doesn't have, superintendent doesn't have, and I would say many people in this room don't have. And uh, uh, I'm going to try to focus on PBS, PBIS, but I'd also like just a little more time because I've sat here for a very long time. And I've heard a lot, a few things that I'd like to respond to. If you can grant me that time. Uh, I, PBIS and restorative justice, uh, it's good stuff. It's uh, philosophically sound. I think it's the way to, to uh, deal with complex problems. Um, I've been, in, uh, you know, I hold on, on, on Vallejo High Campus a, a study group among teachers. I lovingly call it a lay cafe, and we've done readings on PBIS over the years, so I've been familiar with it for five or six years. I've talked to school districts down in Los Angeles where that's been implemented and I have a sense of what it should look like and my issue with it, and I know it's only a year old, but I don't see the implementation coming forth and um, I believe with those ratios that PBIS puts out, the 80, 15, and 5, and I hate to inform the community, but that 5% of the students that fall into that category are being not served at all. They are being woefully neglected. And uh, I only offer as proof, you come and spend some time at Vallejo High Campus here, not just five minutes, not just one period, not just a half a day, spend a day. And let's see, last, yesterday I counted 50 students outside of class between fifth and sixth period. And I'm talking not two minutes after class, I'm talking about students outside of class way into the period. And uh, those are the students that need the help and the, I strongly believe in this issue of equity. My definition of equity is you devote the resources where those resources are needed. I look forward to seeing those resources being devoted there like I said, I, as uh, somebody that's been on campus and for 24 years, I do not see those resources there. This 
the rhetoric associated with all the programs that are going along with PBIS, I don't know what it means. I have some understanding of PBIS and uh, restorative justice only because I've done reading on my own. Uh, the, the way the staff has been uh, delivered the, the information is horrendous. I mean, it's just superficial at best. Uh, there needs to be depth. Um, my understanding of PBIS is if you don't get 80% buy-in from the staff, it's not going to work. And despite what those statistics say, I, I don't think that the staff has bought into it, given the fact that we had a similar program that was put in place last year with uh, Noah Salzman that follows a lot of the same principles. So, you know, in 24 years I've been around long enough that eventually things come around first full circle. It's not like, you know, these are innovative ideas that, you know, popped into somebody's brain. Good teaching is good teaching and good human relationships are good human relationships uh, today and 24 years ago. Um, I'm looking forward to to seeing PBIS and restorative justice have its effect. And a couple other things I, I just need to address, and I, I appreciate the zero there, I can see that. Um, uh, let's see where it's gonna go here. Um, oh, rats, I should have wrote it down. Uh, let's see. Do you want me to come back to you? No, I'll, I'll probably remember as soon as I go sit down. <laughs> Uh, I appreciate your time, and I appreciate your hard work and everything. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Okay. Uh, I, I, you know, my experience is that the best way to affect student outcome with those 5% is you need a low ratio of adult to student. That's the only way it's going to work, and that's, I know that's very expensive, but it's got to be like that. Some students are just, have very difficult times dealing with large numbers of other students that they're working with. You gotta have only three, four, or five students. And that's, that's, what it, that's my, my understanding of equity. That's where you put your resources. That 15% is gonna be swayed, depending which way they see that 5% go. And I'll tell you right now, VHS, that 15%, they're going to 5%. That's where they are. And I, you, the other 80%, I can guarantee you, many of the students at Vallejo High, they throw up their hands and they're wondering what the heck is going on here because they don't see any justice uh, that they are receiving. The students that comply with the rules and get to class on time, they are also not being served. And uh, that's what I like to say. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I just wanted to make a, yes. Um, I wanted to ask a quick question. Director um, Stewart. Yeah. Um, Bruce. No, it, oh. it, it's fine. Okay. Uh, he just mentioned, again, kind of the, the idea of teachers working together and knowing best practices and, and having experience and knowing what works best. I did have a question about um, the structure of PBIS because we brought this 80% number up um, a couple times. And I was curious if the number 80% has to do with total staff, quote, buying into that program being useful for the school site and the students, or is that 80% speaking more to the specific teachers that work with a student and understanding the program that's going to work best for that individual student, and that that is the 80% of the teachers involved with that specific student that needs to be bought in have the same the same acceptance of the specific program for a student to work not all the, the campus looking at 80 percent it, it can i get a clarification on that or do i need to say it better sure i i think i understood it and if i i didn't you'll you'll correct my answer um with regard to the 80 percent number that um, bruce threw out there which we hear a lot um the 80 percent is basically there's a triangle, there's a tier. And so PBIS, if implemented well, and I think we have to look at how we're implementing, I concur with you, 80% um, of the students will respond to PBIS because we are rewarding the positive. 
We're teaching them what the rules are, we're teaching them how the expected behavior, and then we're rewarding when they do that. Then there's this 15% of students that if they see students being rewarded, may or may not come along with us for the ride. And so we can impact and make it 85 or 90 depending on our implementation of the program. And then there's that top tier 5% that you're hearing about, and that's more of the restorative justice interventions, that's more of the full service <coughs> community schools model, and that's more of the counselors and so forth that we're bringing forward with our grant funding. And then with regard to the buy-in piece, um, I just want to state that PBIS is a team effort. And so the team, we haven't just trained our administrators, we train teams of people, as you heard before. And the team then comes up with the system. And if the system isn't working, for example, with regard to truancies or attendance in the morning, then the team comes back, identifies the issue, and comes up with a team response to that. And so again, we have to look at how we're implementing to see if we're actually being effective with regard to that piece. So that's where the 80-15-5 comes from. Okay, that, that was very um, informative. My, my comment had to do with, I believe in the report, you mentioned that you need 80% of staff to buy in mm -hmm. to the program mm -hmm. in order for it to be successful. <coughs> and, my, and my question was whether or not that had to do with um, the six teachers that mm -hmm. deal specifically with the student, mm -hmm. that they have to agree to the tool that they're going to use to assist this child, okay. the method that they're going to use to assist this child, or overarching, you need 80% of staff on campus to buy into the program for it to work. I, I think it's the latter that once you've identified the issues, for example, the truancy issue, mm -hmm. you know, and the staff and the design team has had it, the staff and the design team has had a chance to work and craft it, then you build your buy-in along the way. Mm -hmm. And once you're at that point, possibly an 80%, I've never seen that figure with regard to the buy, I've not seen that in the research, mm -hmm. so I, I don't know about that number. But we do need staff to be at the table working and crafting this program unique to Vallejo High School and every, every other school. Every other school is implementing it differently because their student population is different. <coughs> I hope I answered that. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I, the comment in the grand jury report is that many teachers at VHS are not aware of the purpose and goals of the program. And they also advise that it was unsuccessful because we're not holding students responsible according to school policy. So I'm a little conflicted. If you're not aware, I'm not sure how you can judge something unsuccessful. And I've heard a lot of teachers talk tonight that they know about it, so I'm not sure, I really don't understand this grand jury report, I guess, but okay. So I guess in our response to them, we should tell them that many people are aware. But I also commented that unaware is not acceptable. And I'm glad to hear that teachers are reading on their own and doing other things, and I, and I have faith that many do. But for those that are not, then colleagues, please get your colleagues to be aware. I'm talking about this at my campus. I talk about it with my parents. I talk about it with kids. I'm very aware about of PBIS at my school. I know what the teachers can and cannot do. I know when they have struggles. I volunteered with a sub for a week with the middle schools. The first day, I was unprepared. By that next Friday, I was totally fine. I had every kid in there rewarded with something or dealing with something or we're just dealing with them. I didn't have to make any referrals. I'm not even a teacher. And I got it. So I, again, I, I like the guy's comments about just human relations, common sense, a lot of things like that. This 5%, I guess we're struggling with since we're just now implementing these programs. So let's implement better next time. Thank you. Tiffany Jones. No, I'm sorry, Willie Mims, then Tiffany Jones. I have surely gotten my exercise in a day. Um, you know, I have, I'm somewhat uh, confused by the, uh, the grand jury report and the statement that it's in, in finding nine. 
that the uh, teachers in front of the grand jury in this program has been unsuccessful because the high school administration is not holding the students accountable for their inappropriate behavior. Well, my concern is this. You just had a WASP accreditation in March. Nowhere in that report did, this, did the instructor state that something was not, that this program was not working. And so if the WASP team came here and stayed three days, why wasn't it reflected in, in, the, in the report? That baffles me. And so I have a serious problem with, the, with this grand jury statement in, in which they uh, cited what the teacher said. Who did they speak to? That's the issue. How many administrators did they speak to? How many district personnel did they speak to? Also, in your WASP report, page 12, first paragraph, it says, in an effort to decrease negative behavior and improve student success, as well as provide for a systemic approaches to supporting teachers and improving classroom behavior, the Valero Unified School District adopted the PBIS model. This model focuses on teacher, staff, created school-wide expectations of behavior that are both positive in nature and which are founded on school-wide implement implementation of teacher, staff, created procedures, which are consistently applied. At the beginning of the fall 2012 semester, teacher teams created the expectation of behavior for specific common areas on the campus, restrooms, cafeteria, multi-purpose room, hallways. So, in your WASP report, you say you're doing some things. But in the grand jury report, which I said I just missed anyway, because that's how much I think about it, you say something else. And so, which is more important? The WASP team stayed here three days. They talked to a whole lot of people. The grand jury came here. I don't know how long they stayed. I don't even know who they spoke to um, and what biases they had and what hidden uh, agendas that they had when they answered the uh, grand jury questions. But, so my concern is this. You have your WASP report, which I hold as valid and carry some uh, validity, and you have this grand jury document, which I said it should be dismissed, but I know that you cannot do that. Thank you. Are we all still awake? <laughs> um, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Tiffany Jones. I am a proud um, daughter of this district. Um, I graduated from Hogan High School and I currently work as a counselor with the Oakland Unified School District and I want to come and say that I am excited and happy um, that this report actually came out because it's causing us to take a, a, a cold hard look at how we are educating our students and what we are actually putting out there. So I look at the report and say great job. Um, now it's time to get the work done. Across the bridge, we are also in Oakland Unified School District implementing PBIS. My current school site is in our second year of implementation. Um, uh, the school that I actually started at in Oakland, Cole Middle School, was one of the founders of restorative justice in Oakland. So I want to say to all the teachers and staff that say that it does not work and students that have um, issues with it, it does work. However, it takes a while. You have to get the adults and students and parents on board first. So don't give up. We have a long haul to go. I just want to say that I support Mr. Isidore and the Vallejo High School staff as well as this school board and the community. Um, and I believe that we are going in the right direction. However, I want to make sure that we have an understanding. Our triangle is flipped upside down right now. Right now we are servicing the 95%, the 80% with all of our resources. And it doesn't have to be that way. So we have to take a cold hard look at what we're actually doing. And that's putting the systems in place. That's making sure that the staff 
parents and people are available to do that. It, it sounds easy, but it takes a lot of work. And I think that those that are on the ground doing the heavy, heavy lifting right now are the ones that need the support. So I just want to say thank you for all that you are doing for our kids, and I do see the work. Thank you. Thank you. Findings 10. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know that this is a long night, and just to believe if I could, I'd be home in my bed right now. But because I think that this is important, our kids do come first. When I was a little girl, I see more people get suspended from school, and then I see them in the street as an adult, because programs like this did not exist. I had the opportunity to only hear about this awesome program because I attended a teacher's uh, training during the summer of August where it was introduced for me for the first time. I just didn't buy into it at first because I wasn't sure just how much this can really work until you live in a community of 179 apartments with more than three students that live there. Two years ago, I see more students in my apartment that I always wondered, was it a holiday? And if so, where is my children? Because I thought I sent them to school. However, with this program right here, I have seen more students in school than in my apartment complex, and that's how it should be. My only concern with this program is it says positive behavior intervention and support. That doesn't mean to take students and criticize them with the negative. It's supposed to be positive. And we do all have to buy, and I agree with the teachers. And I wanted, I wanted you to know, Mrs. Waterman, I'm not here to criticize teachers and blame. I'm here as accountability. I said that from day one, and I'm still sticking by it. But what we have to understand is, we sometimes feel like this is a teacher versus student. And because that's our student, we're connected. So it makes it feel kind of personal and offensive. I'm not, I didn't send my son to school so I can come with him. That's the last thing he want to do. I am here every other Wednesday before I got sick again. So all I'm saying is, in that case, can I please have you come to my house when I need some groceries? When, I need, when he needs a ride to school and he's not acting right, you want me to figure it out all by myself. But you know what? I sent him to school because I believe that you, as a teacher, that cares. And I love the teachers that came up here. I would trust them in over anything. I'll say it every time you can ask Dr. Bishop, I'll call right him now and said, I love what this teacher did. Although it was strict, but I love the comments that Charles came home with and confessed what he did wrong. Y'all heard him. He admit when he did something wrong. But the problem is he doesn't, it, 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 it has to be positive. It has to fill it in your heart. You know, you're a parent when you have to discipline your child. Your child knows you love them. And you know they know that it comes from here. And when they don't have that connection, you get more defensive. Back in child and a dog in a position in a corner, you're going to come out fighting. They forget who you are. And that's all I'm asking as a teacher, so please look at it from that point of view. You was a kid one time. You've been bullied and you've been manipulated. So please keep that in mind when you're hearing things. We're all here to learn and work together as a team. But we can't do it if we keep on pointing fingers. Thank you. Thank you. That was our last card on number nine. I'm afraid to say it. Are there any other comments by the board? Hearing none, as I said before, 10, 11, and 12 have to do with the website. Um, so um, Director Waterman, could you read 10? Director Stewart, and Director Munson, 12. Okay. <clears throat> Finding number 10. Vallejo High School site safety plan is incomplete and only available on the Vallejo City Unified School District website. The recommendation? Vallejo City Unified School District update their website to include all missing documentation regarding the Vallejo High School site safety plan and include the safety plan on the Vallejo High School website. Next. Next. 
finding 11, <clears throat> there is a bullying section on the Vallejo City Unified School District website, but is not included on the Vallejo High School's website. The recommendation is that Vallejo City Unified School District incorporate information on bullying currently included in their website and also included on the Vallejo High School website. Number 12, <coughs> oh, one, two. Vallejo High School website does not contain any information about positive behavioral intervention and support for restorative justice. Uh, the recommendation is Vallejo City Unified School District incorporate information on positive behavioral intervention and support and the restorative justice program be included on the Vallejo High School website. Is this the Vallejo High School website? Yes. Yes. May I just point out, um, President Wilson, that at the bottom, um, the reason we brought it up after the students spoke is because we have actually have students describing what positive behavior intervention support is. So if you will scroll down, we're not going to bore you with showing the video this evening, but it's about a six minute video that has our students actually talking about PBIS and their um, perspective on PBIS. And in addition, every single grand jury recommendation is already alive on our Vallejo um, High School website. So uh, what you're saying is since the report, everything has been updated. Okay, and what about the site safety plan? Good evening, Dr. Uh, Dr. Bishop, uh, President Wilson, uh, and board members. Um, I'll be working with Vallejo High School, and we'll review and revise the site safety plan for the, um, the, the this upcoming year for 2013-14, and we will make sure everything is um, um, updated on the websites, both on the school website and the district website. Thank you so much. How are you, how is, uh, who's responsible for doing the updating of your website, Vallejo High School? Yes, uh, Ms. Madison and I. Okay. I know, Dr. Morris, that you are extremely uh, computer savvy, and with, and with uh, <coughs> Ms. Madsen as, as your coach, I know, I, I know he'll be kept up. Thank you. We have no cards on these items. Okay. Moving on, item 13, Director Ubaldi. <coughs> Hi. Hold on. Hold on. I'm, I'm Sylvia Jimenez Martin. Oh, I'm sorry. Finding number 13. One of the major issues in Vallejo High School campus is the use of marijuana. Recommendation. Vallejo High School Administration and Vallejo City Unified School District implement an effective plan to deal with the mar marijuana issue. I just briefly before um, Ms. Jimenez Martin speaks announce that um, Sylvia is our counselor on the ninth grade side. We received a $1.2 million federal grant which allows for two additional counselors and two social workers um, to work in our current full service community schools. So she is one of our recent hires. Lots of energy as you're going to hear in a second. And um, we're also we have posted the social work position maybe three or four times now. We're still looking, so if you know anybody, that social work position will be dedicated to Vallejo High School based on a little over a year ago, Dr. Shackelford and her team put together an amazing federal grant application called Project Restore. Thank you so much. Hi. <laughs> um, I I am full time. I am at two school sites. I am at Solano Middle School for two and a half days, and the other two and a half days, I'm at the ninth grade at School Academy. I have a referral form, and I work with students any from divorce to friendships to anger um, to death, anything with grieving, um, the social and emotional. 
Uh, I do the mental health, health part. Um, I also do a little bit on grades because if something's wrong with the grades, something's wrong with the person, something's going on, I, I try and look at the big picture. I'm also part of the student study team uh, program. Um, let's see. I do drop-ins. Uh, teachers um, do referrals by either um, writing me a note, filling out the referral form, or email. I love the kids. Um, I love the kids. I've been here since January and I only missed one day yesterday because of my back. But the kids are amazing. They're wonderful. They're inspiring. Um, I love coming to work. I love coming to work. Thank you. Thank you. We have cards Hannah, Laura, Rika, Jessica Morris, and Jack Gillespie. Hi, Laura. Good evening. I'm still here. Hi, guys. Um, good evening, and um, I'm Hannah Lorica, and I'm a student in, at Leo High School, and I'm a junior. Um, I'm just here to, since you guys are having this planning mm -hmm. on marijuana issues. This is not just limited on marijuana issues, but like as, as well as other issues like alcohol and, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, I read the, um, an article about the jury report and I just um, read something that I was not very happy about. Um, it, they said that there was a lack of discip discipline enforcement on campus. And I feel that's, that it's very inaccurate. And sometimes, uh, not even, um, I somehow feel it's unfair to our staff who's been working really hard all year, our teachers that have been really working really hard, and I believe that they're spread pretty thin uh, with all of the responsibilities that they have, like, that they have, they're expected of, they're, that are expected of them, I'm sorry. Um, and just, honestly, I think nine campus supervisors are not enough for two relatively big campuses. And in the two campuses with this few to, um, staff to watch over, um, there will be places where the kids will find unwatched. And so the activities, the activities will go on there. And that is not our staff's um, fault. Um, um, so I'm suggesting um, instead of, uh, sorry, I hope that the grand jury has just said that um, there's a lack of human resources to implement those disciplinary actions because, um, yeah, it's not really their fault that they couldn't handle that much in their hands. Um, so I suggest more supervisors, if not uh, more um, cameras in places that are not visible to the staff and maybe even in the hallways, because I personally have an experience where I see gambling in the hallways, and that is not the teacher's fault, because I believe that the teacher's responsibility during class hours is the class lecture and the students in class, because it's not fair to those students in class that are trying to learn. Um, um, it's not fair for us to be disrupted by our because, sorry, it's not fair to us to be disrupted just because the teacher has to go and um, attend to distractions, the distractions outside of class. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a senior here at Boyle High. And um, the 13 says that there's gonna, they want to put more, um, in, I mean, I guess like supervision on the marijuana, but to me, I'm, I've like lived, I've lived in Vallejo since 2004, and uh, I don't see how it is the responsibility of teachers and faculty to control that, that 
activity in a student's life. They have, they really have no no input on it necessarily because it's a community issue. It starts stems from the community. If you go to people's houses, they're doing the same thing. They come to school and partake in it because they do it at home as well. I mean, and if they pick it up at school, then they do it at home still. It's not just a school issue. It's not like people are, they're not standing here like, oh yeah, you know, let's, let's come here and do this. It's, it's everywhere. It's not just here. It's a community issue and the teachers the, the grand jury said that the teachers are not doing enough, but what can, what can you do? People are going to do what they're going to do. They, that's their life choice. People commit crimes. They they say what they want, freedom of speech, you know, um, freedom of expression. You can't tell them that they can't do that. It's like you tell them you can't dress a certain way. That doesn't make sense. Everyone can express themselves, and if that if that's their own thing, you can't you can't put someone that is not of any necessary like input on them because the teacher they're there to teach you but if you're if you don't respect yourself enough to take care of your health and you're partaking in these activities what what can a teacher do for that if they don't want to hear it they're not going to want to hear it so i don't understand how they're not doing it enough because they're already doing as much as they can what more can you do if you send them out then you have no more power over that so i don't, I don't understand what they really meant by saying that they're going to implement more security over that matter. It doesn't make any sense to me how it can be done. So, yes. Jack, can I speak? Is still here? Okay, I think he left. Tiffany Jones. All of my questions are obviously towards the end. Um, so I basically just have a question as far in regards to the Project Restore. I understand that um, it's, support, it's designed to support students with the social emotional piece, but I also wanted to know, does that include an alcohol and other drugs type of counselor, which is a different type of counselor that primarily deals with the usage of the marijuana? And I also wanted to say that, again, I'm gonna plug PBIS and restorative justice. This is another opportunity to use those systems school-wide as well as individualized to eliminate, not eliminate, but to draw some attention to some of these issues. Again, it is a community problem um, that does spill over into the school environment, but the question is how do we address the issues here on campus? Because it's clearly a safety issue. If you're high out your mind, um, you are a danger to myself as well as the other, camp other students and everybody else on the campus. But what's going to be the intervention that is key? And so sometimes um, I have students that are actively using marijuana and other drugs. That's beyond my scope of um, understanding. So I do have to refer out to a, um, a Thunder Road, which is an inpatient treatment program for students that, you know, are actively using drugs. So I just wanted to kind of know, does the Project Restore portion of it um, address the specific use of marijuana, alcohol, and other drugs, and is there a counselor or somebody that has that expertise? Thank you for that great question. And yes, um, in support of the full service community schools, we have a number of community partners that are housed right here on our campuses, specifically on our high school campuses. We have an MOU with our local youth and family services that do provide us with a substance abuse counselor. She was unable to be here today because she blew out her knee. So um, we did have her on the agenda to speak to some of the work that she does in building rapport and relationships with our students who are um, dealing with this type of an issue. So yes, we do. Comments from the board. Director Waterman, thank you. Um, earlier this evening, we heard some um, suggestions that illegal activity on our campuses are somehow not being reported. Can I please get some confirmation that things that are illegal are being reported to the police? There are things that we are mandated to report. Thank you. That's what I figured, and I wanted to make sure we got that clear since we had the opportunity. Um, it also states that we have a marijuana problem on our campus, and I wonder what evidence the grand jury presented in proof of that. Because, um, I'd like evidence. Um, we 
did invite the grand jury to be here this evening. I'm not sure if any are present. Um, so we, we don't know. I mean, I don't doubt that our children are experimenting. Um, I just wonder about that kind of a, a blanket statement. It sounds like hearsay to me. And especially if we report these things to the police, that would have been a simple thing to do, is go to the police department and at least ask for some numbers. But it strikes me that that never happened. Thank you. Uh, my concern is, in some cases, I'm, I'm sure that there are using uh, going on, and I'm sure that there is um, probably other illegal activities going on. My concern is a child who's in a home where the usage is per the parent, and the child comes to school because this report addressed teachers reporting the children reeking of, uh, of uh, marijuana. It would be in their clothes. Um, and how do you deal with that child? Uh, you want them arrested? You want them, you know, certainly if you see a child use it, if you find it on them, that's different. But if a child smells of marijuana, then we have other issues to deal with. One of the things that I would like to suggest to have those children out, because I'm sure it's uncomfortable for them to smell like that. Uh, we have um, at the plunge facilities for washer and dryer. The washer and dryer is broken but and outdated. I would suggest that we uh, look at a uh, uh, the commercial they use have a, of... They have a washer and dryer that's functioning at the ninth grade academy in the girls' gym. I understand that, and they also have it at the boys' gym. Okay. But I'm giving the child as much privacy as possible. Okay, so that's why I'm su 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 suggesting the plant where the child themselves can go and, uh, with the assistance of the, uh, maybe the plunge director, to uh, uh, use a uh, industrial, light industrial type washer or dryer. I, I, I want us to in, investigate that because it has to be uncomfortable for, for the child. But just the smell does not uh, convict the child. So if the allegation is that administration is not suspended them because they smell like marijuana, I don't have an issue with that. It's when they're using or selling or any other indication you know, on the possession. So, uh, but if we can <coughs> look at doing that, that would be, I think, a help to, uh, to, to, the, to the students. Any other comments? Okay, hearing none, we're combining 13 and 14, Director Ubaldi. I'm sorry, 14 and 15. Thank you, Madam President. Palaya High School's daily detention is monitored in a supervising campus supervisor's office by individuals who may or may not be present. Recommendation 14, Vallejo High School's daily detention be monitored in a classroom setting by a credential teacher. And then finding 15, in-house suspension is usually held only once a week. It may or may not be a, on, the day, on the day the student was placed on suspension. Recommendation 15, Vallejo High School administration create in-house suspension on a daily basis monitored by a credential teacher. Again, my name is Jessica Brown, and in response to recommendation 14, Willow High School administration has implemented administrative detention, which is monitored solely by Willow High School administrators and has been in place since the beginning of the school year. In regards to recommendation 15, um, 
Vallejo High School actually does have uh, in-house suspension. Uh, as students are sent out or class suspended, they are actually um, monitored in the dean's office uh, by myself or Ms. Brown or Mr. Shaban on the ninth grade side on a daily basis. Uh, this has been in place since the beginning of the school year. In addition, uh, we have weekly in-school suspension that is monitored by a credentialed teacher. Thank you. Mustafa Abdugani. He's not here. Any uh, comments by the board? Again, the grand jury didn't actually contact our school to ask whether this was true or not. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Our response is due by August the 14th. Um, I hope that staff has um, taken copious notes. Um, and I'm hoping that um, what we have design teams, that they are able to meet and give us information prior to uh, August 1st or close thereby so that we can provide a response. Um, that um, all stakeholders are included in the process and that the board, after we have um, gathered the information, prepared our response, that early in the school year that we hold another meeting here at Vallejo High School giving our response to the grand jury report. And um, our response is to be in writing. Um, and I just also send an electronic copy. Of the electronic copy, I would like um, to have embedded a video clip of the um, video that was taken with the independent investigation report attached to the response so, and uh, all our suggestions I hope that we have something to uh, follow up with any more public comment yeah. uh, yes <laughs> mr. Willie Mills why did I say it no <laughs> I just wanted to say that the, that the process that you went through today, I thought was somewhat new and somewhat fair because it involved the uh, total community in, in uh, uh, recommendation 1 through 15. And that's something that I've never seen before. So I have to compliment you. Normally, <laughs> normally the, uh, the, the um, the staff will only allow you to speak at one time on everything. But you know, when you allowed us to speak on each of those individual items, I didn't. I, I did not understand the process until later. And then I said, "Oh well, you know. I mean, uh, I got, I got, I'm finding some speaker cards. To make sure I have my <laughs> agenda." In. So I like this process, you know. But but anyway, I just wanted to uh, compliment you, the staff, and, and the board and the uh, 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 community for coming to express their concerns. I know, I know that uh, some of you do not agree with me, but a whole lot of people don't agree with me. It does not matter. I just had an opinion, and so I came. Uh, uh, I'm not sure when I'll come back, but, but at least you know that I was here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this process is a process that I'm very familiar with and that I would use uh, whenever I held a meeting, uh, as you know, I was a large corporate audit manager with the Internal Revenue Service. So whenever I held my meeting with meetings with uh, the corporate executives, and we are to discuss a report, finding after finding after finding, so that 
everybody had their input and they and their say on both uh, items. And uh, I presented it to Dr. Bishop and she was gracious enough to concur that uh, it was a process that we thought would benefit this particular forum. So we are looking forward to again having a follow-up meeting and we would like to do, do that early in the school year after we, and so that we can present our response to the grand jury. We're not trying to hide anything. We're not gonna keep anything secret. You'll know what the board and how the board responded to the grand jury. Um, any more comments by, by board members? Uh, Vice President Ubaldi. Madam President. Uh, yes, sir. I, uh, I really want to thank you for initiating this conversation, and I know that uh, it was your idea, and, I, and I'm grateful that you, you would do that. And I also appreciate how the, the staff has responded to, to this process that uh, we had this evening, and I commend you for that, uh, Madam President. And I also want to... to uh, uh, state that how much I agree with in this Tiffany Jones observation that uh, this could be a blessing in disguise, that uh, this report could have, could have been easily be a threat to, to us, but, but we looked at it in a positive way, responded to it in the most positive way, and uh, we were not in any way defensive, and I appreciate that deeply. And, and, I, um, and I know that that I agree with Mr. Mims' comment also, that the solution is gonna come from the total community. And I sense very much this evening that there is a, a spirit from, from the staff, from the students, from the parents, and the community that we're in this together. And we will work on it. And uh, I look forward to that uh, get, get together, uh, President uh, Wilson, in September, when we can truly celebrate the opportunity really respond in the most positive way. Thank you. Thank you. Director Mumps. I wanted to um, out loud thank everyone who participated this evening, uh, the audience and community members, uh, especially the um, our student body participants and their, their passion and, and understanding of what's going on around here. That's very exciting. And I'm once again looking forward to your graduation week coming up here. It's another celebration. I hope we can all um, feel some reward for our efforts uh, as, as a uh, community school and all our schools here in the Bolivia City Unified School District. Thank you all for your involvement, passion, whatever level. Thank you. Director Stewart. Thank you. Echoing the comments of my colleagues, I'm glad that we were able to hear from all stakeholders this evening. Um, we had a very fruitful conversation. Um, again, this is kind of a I opened the starting point for us though. We need, this was a hard look in the mirror. Um, and so, you know, this was a good philosophical conversation. It's going to be about implementation of things and moving forward, having uh, good communication and building trust um, amongst um, all members of this community. Um, also, wanted to mention that not everyone is comfortable with this setting for speaking. And so I would hope that we provide a means for continued dialogue. Um, again, this was very specific to Vallejo High School, but many of these issues we deal with district-wide. And so if there are comments that people want to make specific to the findings or the recommendations or to any other um, things that are concerning them within our district, I would hope that we have the systems in place for e um, easily um, submitted comments and on your own time, so you don't have to come to a meeting at a specific time and come across town, whatever the case may be, to keep this dialogue moving and to find the, the uh, solutions that we're, we're seeking. Um, and finally, just, you know, we, we have to keep the mindset of collaboration. I look forward to uh, the work that has to be done to get us ready for the next school year. And so, um, you know, there's gonna be small scale meetings to address these issues and then we'll have our, our full discussion in the community about what, how we're going to move forward. But thank you all for coming and uh, participating this evening. Director Waterman, for me enough tonight? Ditto. Thank you. 
I appreciate everyone coming out. Um, uh, this was a great opportunity. I looked upon it as a, uh, uh, the opportunity for us to look at ourselves. Um, there was nothing to be defensive about. And for us to get clarity as much as possible with um, the recommendations and uh, for which we will have to go forward and make decisions. Some are bu budgetary. Um, and as we know, yes, we have uh, financial authority back with the oversight of a trustee. Um, but that takes a great fiduciary uh, responsibility. And we're not going to uh, just haphazardly spend money. So uh, we will look very closely at everything. Uh, safety is very important to Dr. Bishop, to this governing board, and we will continue to monitor these items. And I really welcome this grand jury report, um, and I'm looking greatly forward to responding to it. Our next uh, governing board meeting is Wednesday, June the 5th at Franklin Middle School.